Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Monday Warfare, The Battles Within. We're in episode 15 now. I'm your host, Ray Russell. Joining me this time is Mr. Steve Ekstad, as always. Steve, you ready to talk a little more Nitro and Raw from 1996? I'm always ready to talk about this stuff, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, at least you're enthusiastic about this era. Me, not so much. Oh, there's, there's good things. Don't get me wrong. And I think we're going to see I, a, few, I, a few good things here this I, week. There's always something good. Yeah, there's always some. But I, I grew up, I really got into wrestling in 93, and I was hooked probably to about 2002, 2003, where I was watching religiously. I mean, I, I could go from 93 to probably 2003 where I didn't miss an episode at all, maybe one. Um, I missed a big angle with Brutus getting smoked with the uh, briefcase. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I mean, you know, I started watching wrestling at a different time, and obviously that those first several years were, like, you know, my peak years. Of course, there are a lot of people's peak years, though. You go back to the 80s and, and the beginning of the 90s and things. And 93 to 96, you don't hear that often. <laughs> but, I hey, mean, man. Just, all... <laughs> uh, that, was the, that was the age frame. And I, I, I'm not like um... – when I was growing up, like I watched Raw, but I always went to the video stores and I watched. I got watched, every yeah, I know you used to watch everything. I, I, and I yeah. went back and I went back and I, I love the the eighty eight, eighty nine years. Those are my favorite. Um, I didn't grow up with it. I was like two years old, but <laughs> when I was young and into wrestling, I, like it was all good to me. I didn't care how terrible. I mean, it's terrible now. You know, like looking back on it, it's not the best, but that's what I grew up with. So I have like a an affection for it. Because yeah. that's what I grew up with. I didn't yeah, have anything. I enjoyed everything myself at you know at the young age. I mean, even the shit matches. I didn't realize they were completely shit matches at the time. A little older, it's a bit different story here. So we're gonna spot a bunch of shit matches. I'm sure as we continue on here in 1996. If you're ready to get going, I have a little bit of WCW news. Yeah, I'm ready for some news here. All right, well, that's good because I'm going to give you a couple bits of news. I don't know how important one of them are, but I'm going to touch on them both anyway. Brian Pillman had throat surgery at Vanderbilt University on March 13th. Gene Okerlund on the WCW hotline then reported that Pillman didn't actually have the surgery and was making it up, claiming he had been in the hospital and there was no record of Pillman being there. This resulted in a legal letter from Pillman's agent to Gene Okerlund, complete with Pillman's patient discharge sheet. And it asked Gene Oakland to make a correction during the Monday Nitro telecast. However, Okerlund then conveniently missed Nitro with the quote unquote flu. Now, I can't say Gene didn't have the flu. I mean, it could be a case of a hangover, knowing Gene Okerlund as well. So it's a very convenient that Gene just happened to miss the only time, well, maybe the second time now he's missed an episode of Nitro when he's being forced to um, go back on, on comments he made on the hotline. Seems like me and Gene just says whatever he wants on the hotline and thinks there should be no ramifications. Yeah. I heard him talking about, he had a very a serious case of the flu. That's why he wasn't there. I thought it was odd, but now we know he, he stalked shit on the wrong guy. He <laughs> got called out for it. I didn't realize it was initially the Pillman situation. I actually just thought it was a hangover until I actually read this. Uh, uh, the DeMelt says this anyway. And it's kind of funny cause we go back and yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that later in this episode. Uh, what the melts came out with just a few few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago now, about this entire situation with Pillman and this surgery and all that, everything that played out with it. The other bit of news I want to get to before we get to Nitro, Steve, is there was a March-April issue of Playboy's Book of Lingerie, a two-page spread of the Diamond Doll billed as Kimberly Page. And the reason this is relevant to me personally, no, I didn't have this magazine, but once upon a time, probably before she was even called Kimberly, maybe she was still the Diamond Doll. My brother had some random magazine, and on the back cover page, and inside the back cover page, was a picture of Kimberly wearing, let's just say, revealing clothing, uh, maybe some uh, netting for a top, so you can imagine what was showing. And we were like, oh, that looks like the Diamond Doll. I think that's the Diamond Doll. She couldn't be in this. And then we didn't know her name was Kimberly at the time, but we saw the name was Kimberly Page. And we go, holy shit. Maybe it really is her. Then eventually she became Kimberly. So it's kind of funny to see her doing this here in 1996 because she was doing this long before 1996. In fact, that's probably how DDP found her. Probably. <laughs> and the stories that we heard about them, uh, it's not far-fetched. <laughs> no. So I just brought back memories. I'm like, man, did my brother have this book? But no, I knew it was before this. And uh, it wasn't necessarily the lingerie, was but more a like Playboy? a- Playboy? No, it was just some kind of- It wasn't like a nude magazine, but there were revealing type- pictures in it so it was like she was wearing almost like a fishnet top 
kind of, sort of, maybe like on, on the beach or something. I can't remember, man. It's been 25 years, but yeah. Glorious picture. And <laughs> so she's still rocking it here in 96. I'm going to have to find it. I kind of want to see it. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, saying. I'm say sure it's, I'm, sure it's a, that. I'm sure it's a Google away, Google search away. <laughs> I don't, I, I mean, let's be honest. Once we, we all got the internet and could search, you know, these women, Kimberly's probably one of the first ones you look at. And I, I don't remember ever seeing her on the beach with like a netting like that, that you're describing. So yeah, yeah you could have that unseen, uh, uh, nude Kimberly picture out there. Um, that's not out there. So make it's, it happen, Ray. A, make it happen. It's a possibility. Yes, absolutely. Nude. <laughs> good times in the good old days. We'll move on now, though, to WCW Nitro, and sometimes what is the bad old days. Maybe not necessarily this episode. We'll have to see. This week, we're in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the old UTC Arena. Wow, old school here. Unfortunately, I think this is one of those weeks I just don't have results as far as how many people are are in the... uh, This may be the first week I don't have attendance record here for the show. Shame on you, DeMeltz, for dropping the ball this week as we see Pepe in a cowboy hat, and the show kicks off with the giant beating on Loch Ness in the aisle. Before the show even gets started, apparently the brawl began, and I thought at first they were fighting back and forth, and then as the fight just continued and continued, I hate to call it a fight, it was just a giant beating the shit out of the Loch Ness monster who just kind of stood there because he really couldn't sell. And then the comedy ensued. Comedy hijinks galore. As Lex Luger's music hits, he's scheduled to defend his TV title against Loch Ness. Luger comes out and completely ignores that there's Godzilla versus King Kong right in front of him in the aisleway. Luger busts out a big uh, double bicep pose, throws his belts down, has Pyro, the whole nine yards, all the works. And to the ring goes Lex Luger, completely ignoring the giant beating the shit out of Loch Ness as he heads down there and hits the ring. Luger then demands the referee to ring the bell and begin the match. The referee reluctantly does so and immediately counts Loch Ness out. In about 12 seconds, Lex Luger picks up the easy win here as Jimmy Hart heads to ringside and jumps in Lex's arms. They celebrate jumping up and down, having fun, and Lex realizes, hey, what are you doing here? Get out of here, Jimmy Hart. What do you think old Lex are here? Uh, he's cracking me up when he walk, just walk right by those two dudes. Oh, I, that's got to be seen to be believed. I can't even do it justice. It was oh, tremendous. My God. It was as if those guys weren't there, and the fact that they're so large made it 10 times more comical. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then he, you said he did his, uh, he did his pyro and everything, right? Yeah, he got pyro. He threw his belts down. He did some <laughs> posing, down. double yeah. biceps. Oh, yeah, it was. And he was standing right next to this, and he never even acknowledged it. That was the funny part. It was like it wasn't even there. Yeah, he just walked. He just when he threw the belts down and the pyro went off, I was dying laughing. I was like, oh, this was great. guy, he's on a roll right now, man. It's so good. It's so good. So Lex picks up the easy victory here. Thank God for Lex. He didn't actually have to wrestle the Loch Ness. I'm sure he was ecstatic about that. As Lex heads over to the announcer's table, says it's the quickest title win in WCW history. He tells Mongo it's like winning an NFL game on the coin toss. I got to tell you, Steve, the last four weeks of Lex Luger is probably the best shit to me that he's done since he slammed Yokozuna. Uh, he's literally taking his inability in the ring at this point and focusing it on other aspects of his character, and it's really working out for this past month. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it all started with the Jimmy Hart stuff, and he's really added on to it and taking it further. He's hilarious. He's like the best thing going on Nitro right now, to be honest with you. Just looking to see what what's things, what stupid stuff he comes up with and just acting completely aloof and acting like there's really – he has no idea what's going on. It's great because yeah, it, it's so it's believable. Even like the '89 Luger is believable. This is believable too. He's like so stuck on himself, so so stuck on Lex Luger that he doesn't even care or, or realize what's going on around him. He doesn't care about anything but Luger, and it makes sense. Yeah, it was uh, definitely uh, a funny, funny bit here by Lex Luger, and he's done for the night. So hey, kudos to Lex Luger for getting paid to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> So because we technically don't really have a match match, Eric Bischoff says there's a standby match next after the commercial break, but no, he fools us into sticking around. It's really Tony Schiavone. Yes, I said Tony Schiavone. Remember Mean Gene's out with the flu, which I didn't know going into this show. So when they came back from break and the Chiron read Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I heard Tony's voice, I thought the network screwed up and jumped to another episode down the line. I thought it, I was like, what the fuck just happened? And then, no, I realized, no, we're still on the right episode. 
I said, what is Tony doing here? I loved it. It threw me off at first, hearing Tony's voice and then seeing Tony. This is like Tony's first appearance, I think, on Nitro, is it not? I don't know if it's been a while or what what exactly it was, but it could have been his debut on, on there. It was weird hearing it. I was like, what the hell is Tony Schiavone doing here? Yeah, it threw me off, um, but I was happy. Yeah, I was too. He brings out Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, who he refers to as the Mega Powers. Not only does Tony do so, but Hulk Hogan during the promo refers to the duo as the Mega Powers. So trying to get away with a little bit here. We learn there's a tornado tag match later in the show. They talk more about this doomsday cage match, which up until now was supposed to be Hulk Hogan taking on four guys in four cages. However, over the last five, six days, the match has been changed. Thanks to Hulk Hogan. It's now the Mega Powers together taking on as as many people as Hulk Hogan feels like or can find between now and the pay-per-view here this Sunday. Amazing. Yeah, I I thought that was the the deal the whole time. I didn't realize it was supposed to be just Hogan in there. Uh, I I, I thought that's how it was supposed to be the whole time. I never knew any different. So this wasn't like a surprise to me. So like reading The Observer and finding out that this was kind of a bait and switch type deal where you got Hogan in there or Savage in there and added more people. I'm not surprised. It, it is what it is. I'm kind of glad he added Savage. Um, yeah, made the no match doubt. a little bit better because Macho was Macho just brings it. It doesn't matter. And I know we talk about that a lot, but he just brings it. He's not going to shortchange anybody. He's going to bring the effort, the energy, and things like that. So I'm cool with it. I know this is like one of those things that they're going to hang Hogan on <laughs> if it the, if the rating tanked or the buy rate tanked for uncensored if, by doing this. Right. It's going to be one of those things held over him. But once we get there, we'll find out how it turns out. So Eric Bischoff promised us a standby match, and that's what we get here. The public enemy now officially in both standby matches in the history of Nitro at this point as they take on this time the Steiner brothers. Rocco Rock with a spinning arm drag on Scott Steiner early on, but Scotty back with a tilt-a-whirl slam. Rocco rolls outside but lands on a table. Scotty teases diving off onto Rocco, so... Rocco gets off the table. Pretty wise there. Back inside, it's Rick Steiner with a Buzz Sawyer power slam on Johnny Grunge and then Steiner lines to both public enemy. Grunge takes over on the floor, bulldogging Rick Steiner onto a plastic... These plastic chairs were something else on this episode. Rocco Rock overshoots a middle rope moonsault and they call it a headbutt instead. Wise move, not by just by Eric Bischoff on commentary, but Rocco plays it off in the ring as well. Rocco rocked an off the top rope into a nasty Rick Steiner power slam Damn near broke his neck. All Rocco's fault. He didn't tuck in time. Then Scott Steiner nails a super Samoan drop off the ropes. Rocco Rock comes back with a springboard moonsault press on Scott Steiner for a two count. Johnny Grunge in. Even doing wrestling moves himself. Johnny Grunge with a swinging neck breaker and a sit out clothesline. You don't see that too often. People don't realize Rocco's time in the business goes back like, God, 15 years at least, maybe more. And they even used to joke with him, call him grandpa. Because he was like pushing 40, I think, by the time he got to WCW. People don't realize how long Rocco was in the business. Even Grunge, at one point, had to wrestle, if you want to call it that, on the indie circuit before Public Enemy ever made it big. Match goes on. Scott Steiner reverses a superplex, drops Grunge face first on the mat, but Rocco shoves Scott off the top rope as well. Scott Steiner still back up first with an overhead belly-to-belly on Grunge and a hot tag to Rick Steiner for a four-way melee as Scotty mounts Grunge for the 10 punches in the corner but Rocco knocks Scotty off into the floor, allowing Rick to get placed on a table outside. Rocco goes for the somersault plancha, putting Rick through the table, but Scott pulls brother Rick off, and Rocco misses, goes straight through the table all on his own, and he's out of it. Meanwhile, back in the ring, it's the top rope assisted bulldog by the Steiners on Johnny Grunge to get the win in an even seven minutes. Another good match by the Steiners here. They've only been here a couple weeks, but they're putting together decent matches with whomever they're in here with, whether it be the roadies or the public enemy. And you can't say that for a lot of other teams. They're not getting good matches out of the roadies or public enemy. Another match that could have easily been on uncensored instead of maybe say the Chicago street fight, but being public enemy and all, I felt like they got shafted by not being put in the actual uncensored paper. It seems like that's what they would have been hired for. Yeah. They kind of go hand in hand. This is a really good match. I thought, I mean, it was, it got sloppy towards the end. You can only expect the public enemy be able to keep it clean and crisp wrestling wise for a few minutes before it breaks down. The Steiners just don't care, man. They're going to make you work. You're going to take bumps. You're going to eat some moves. And if you don't like it tough, they're going to do it anyway. 
And that, that calls for a good match. It really brings out, it makes these other guys look competent and look decent. It's not them just beating the shit out of each other, or brawling around ringside and things like that. They're actually getting put in wrestling moves. And even, even the public enemy were doing some decent wrestling and keeping it crisp and clean there for a little bit. So um, I was surprised by this one. Yeah, I was too. I thought it was going to be much more of a cluster fuck than, than it actually was. It turned out okay. I agree with you. Not a bad yeah. match. Good TV match for sure. During the commentary in that match, Eric Bischoff makes mention of two things. First, he mentions that Dennis Rodman is suspended from the NBA. I don't remember if it was for six games or six weeks of games. I can't remember how he six announced games. it. Six games. Six games. That's what I thought it was. Six games, yeah. I can't remember what he did back here, but it was, you know, Rodman being Rodman he in this period. Was that what it was? This when he yeah. headbutted the, I think it was the headbutt to the ref. Referee, yeah. I, I remember the referee, yeah. yeah, attacking the ref or whatever. Yeah, only gets you six games for headbutting a ref. Amazing. Also, <laughs> It'd be like 30 games now. Yeah, it would be, it would be half this, yeah, the whole season. Jeez, oh, man. It was also <laughs> mentioned during the commentary uh, that a 1992 Olympian would for, soon be joining WCW, though he doesn't really mention who. It winds up being Chip Minton, who was uh, from the Olympic bobsled team. And I don't know that he ever made a Nitro. He's basically a uh, Orlando tapings guy, <laughs> Disney MGM type guy down there in <laughs> Orlando. <laughs> But yeah, Chip Mitten on his way in. I think they only mentioned this because Mark Henry recently appeared on WWF programming, so it's like tit for tat there. As we go back to the ring for Come on, get some. Yeah, yeah. Come on, get some. Yeah, yeah. Big brother booty. Shake, 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 woo. Big brother booty. Shake, 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 woo. Big Brother Booty, shake, 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 shake. How do you think about that song, Steve? You love that song or what? Terrible. Beautiful. Jimmy Hart. Can I'm you believe? Sure. Yes, yes, absolutely, Jimmy Hart. But can you believe that in record time they come up with this song? <laughs> I mean, it's literally written for <laughs> Booty Man in in such a short period. Like, look how quick Hogan worked it, uh, acted on getting his Big Brother bro- Broody Booty. Sorry. Uh, a spot on the show, a spot in the main event. He's got his own theme song. He's got himself a, a, a valet. Insane. <laughs> He's hooking his boy up. Yeah, but that song, man, whew, that's rough. Terrible. Could you imagine like Booty Man versus Disco and just have him come out back to back like that? Oh, what if they teamed up? Like the Shake Your Booty Tour all year long. It could have been, yeah. Oh, man. There you go. They missed the boat on that one. I'll tell you where else they missed the boat. They missed the boat for Arn Anderson here. Arn Anderson should have stayed uh, stayed home and not caught this boat. As he steps in the ring, woman by his side, Arn Anderson takes on the booty man. Fucking beefcake comes to the ring. He's got Brutus the Barber gear. He's got Brutus the Barber tights, the sleeveless jacket from the from the uh, late 80s gimmick, the, the strutting around the ring, the old kiss my hand and smack my ass spot. He's, it's beefcake without the shears. And a much older and even shittier beefcake at that. He's done nothing to change up the character. He's Brutus Beefcake without the barber shears. It worked, didn't it? I mean, it, it, the first it time. Not, not, this is not, not working. Not the booty man. No, it's definitely not working. Feel bad for Arn, but this is kind of payback for what he gets for beating Hogan twice. <laughs> yeah. So Arn, I wrote Arn here. Arn looking as thick as he's ever been, and I don't mean that in a negative way. He's just like he's bigger than Beefcake here. He's just like. Another worldly sized Arn Anderson, probably on a little bit of those vitamins. I think at this point, everybody is at this point. It's back and forth as the booty man takes over. Woman finally decides to take her shoe off. We know what's coming next, but no, it's Kimberly 
to ringside, and Roman confronts Kimberly but Booty out to try to make the save for the upcoming Booty Babe. And that's when Arn, at- Arn Anderson sneak attacks Beefcake from behind, slides him back into the ring, but as Arn tries to get back in the ring to attack Booty Man, it's Booty with a high knee to the side of the head, which was actually a really good spot. I can't believe I'm saying that, but oh, I it loved was it. was the, the, the perfection of Arn to feed his head through the ropes, Beefcake's timing, high knee to the side of the head, and Beefcake gets the win in 5 minutes and 41 seconds. Arn Anderson's undefeated singles Nitro streak comes to an end at the hands of Ed fucking Leslie. And I wrote, when I found out this match was only 5 minutes and 41 seconds, I kept telling myself as I was watching this, wow, this is really long. This match felt much longer than it actually was to me. Beefcake is just awful. and it, But it pays to have low friends in high places. That's right. It's like, it's like watching a Freebirds match in 96. That's what this is. Lots of stalling and shenanigans and stupid stuff to get to five minutes. It wasn't five minutes of action. It was five minutes of crap. Um, <laughs> but I agree with you. I agree with you completely. That The high knee was really good. It was it was delivered perfectly. Uh, Arn fed it. Beefcake hit it at the perfect time. And it had a nice little sound to it when he connected. All in all, that finish was good. But other than that, the match was garbage. And for those who don't get the pun, it's the booty man with the high knee, or the high knee, if you will, as he picks up the win there. And this week on WCW Saturday Nights, the Road Warriors taking on Public Enemy. Uh, Sting in the ring with Earl Robert Eaton. Lex Luger defends the TV title against Brad Armstrong. Eddie Guerrero versus Alex Wright. Ric Flair versus Craig Pittman. That sounds like a stacked show. Saturday night type level matches, but still a stacked show of competitive matches. Yeah, Saturday night's getting really good ratings at this point. They're doing really well without Hogan even being on it. Makes you wonder. So, I know ba- Melt uh, speculated on that. And back to the ring, we saw the Steiners and the Public Enemy. Now we see the Road Warriors taking on the Nasty Boys. And the Nasties hit the ring. They're taped up from that attack last week that kept them from making it to the arena. The Nasties attack the roadies to start brawling everywhere. As we head into a commercial break, back from break, Knobs takes a nasty bump across the top rope and even gets knocked off the apron into the guardrail. Animal winds up smashing Sags with a chair literally in front. Nick Patrick couldn't have been closer to these two if he tried. If he had his nose up one of their asses, he couldn't be any closer. Nick Patrick's literally in between Animal and Sags as Animal smashes Sags with a chair, and they still don't call it. Brawling back and forth as all four men appear very blown up at this point, especially Hawk. And both nasty boys. The Steiners wind up attacking both tag teams. They're looking for revenge on the roadies from cheating last week to beat them. And Animal, once again, takes advantage, uses the spiked forearm for the second week in a row, the uh, spiked forearm pad, and nails knobs with it. The roadies cheat again to pick up another win in 8 minutes and 25 seconds, but they're not selling them as heels. They just keep cheating as baby faces. Makes no sense. Uh, I have no idea what's going on with the Road Warriors. They're rough looking. They're hard to watch. And the cheating, like, that's completely against what the Road Warriors are all about. They never had to cheat before to win. They were just badasses that are going to kick everybody's ass, and they're not being booked that way anymore. So terrible officiating per the usual. That must have never changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that, this match was a dud. Like, it was nothing. You knew it was going to be bad as soon as you seen the four guys on there. Yeah, and then obviously the Steiners run in. We have three teams, six-man brawl. Nobody's selling for anybody. Nobody wanting to give up to anyone. Steiners literally no-sell chair shots from Hawk. Both of them stand there as Hawk busts them over the head with chairs. They just stand there staring at him. Nobody wants to sell for anyone, so there's no point in having this happen. Uh, for as good as the Steiners roadie were, roadies were last week, this was a mess. Complete opposite. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All of it, like as soon as you get the nasty boys involved, you know it's the it's gonna go downhill. It's gonna be terrible. When you add in the other four guys not wanting to do anything either, <laughs> you got a recipe for disaster, and that's exactly what this was. Here's another recipe for disaster. It's Hogan and Savage taking on Flair and Sullivan, I stand corrected, in this Texas tornado match. With woman again accompanying the heels to the ring, Hogan steals free merchandise from one of the fans places a Macho Man foamed hat over the head of Ric Flair. I had to laugh as Hogan begins beating Flair up. Flair can't see where he's going, and he begins selling punches that Hogan isn't even throwing. Oh, yeah, the foam hat. It was funny. (laughs) I like this spot. 
be salty if I lost my hat. But uh, I'd been pissed if I paid for that and it gets destroyed on Flair's head. Well, that's why I said you, I think you I think that it was, was handed free. out, but it was. I think it was free it was merch. Savage. So I'm, I guess <laughs> they passing out Savage merch too. You really think Hogan's gonna let them get Savage merch? I don't know they make, because they probably had to pay for Macho. No, well, it's possible. I just hat. I just never see any merch in the crowd. So whenever I see it at all, I just presume it's free at this point. Yeah, it's crazy. I think I had one of those hats right before he left WWF. I went to a house show and I think I got one. I just I, I loved it. I loved like it with days later. I just loved the hat being over Flair's eyes. He started selling punches before Hogan yeah. was throwing them, and it was it was pretty comical. Oh, it was funny. It was a pretty good spot. It really was. And then as is a since this is a tornado tag match and all four guys are in at the same time, they're all over the place, which means WCW's favorite new thing to do, dual screens. As Flair chokes Savage with a cord, and plastic chairs run wild in this match. We see double figure fours. Who will quit first? Hogan has his big long legs applied on the small Kevin Sullivan. Looks ridiculous. While Ric Flair has Savage in the figure four as well. Savage winds up turning his over. So Flair has to release. Flair gets up and does the shoving spot with referee Randy Anderson. Anderson shoves Flair back and Flair takes a bump for little old Pee Wee there. And more dual screen action as woman hands Flair a shoe. And he nails it. Bam! Shoot a Hogan. One, two, but Hulk up, brother. And Hulk Hogan back up, but Arn Anderson rushes the ringside. Hogan with a big boot as Arn winds up tripping Hogan before he can land the leg drop. Arn and Pillman then attack the Macho Man. Hogan comes out to make the save, but the bell sounds about 10 minutes into this. Dave Meltzer calls it a DQ win for the baby faces. Other reports call it a double count out. I have no idea what the hell happened here. Definitely wasn't a double count out because it's a tornado match and they were all over the place. So I don't, I think they did say that Hogan won by DQ, if I remember right. Because I have it on here, bells rung and this one's over, but nobody knows what the hell the result is. And then it looks like Hogan won because I think the ref raised their hands. I just got to point out in this match before we get to the post-match stupid shit. Um, Mm -hmm. Savage was the only guy, to be honest, that looked uh, weak out here. And it wasn't like he looked weak because he he is positioned weak. He's just the only guy selling anything for anybody. Like Sullivan and Flair ain't even selling nothing that Hogan's doing to them. Like they're over the shit. Sullivan never sells anyway. Like, Savage is making himself look like he's dying, like how he sells. He's just being macho. Right. And it, it really, really sticks out when you got three people who have one who don't want to do business with each other, but he's out there doing it for everybody. It has made him look weak. The match before, they were brawling all over the place. So once you see that, it kind of just takes it away from this match. You have a Texas Tornado match. You don't need four guys out there brawling all over the place doing what the main event's going to be doing. So, like, by the time you got to the main event, it's like, man, I just seen the Steiner, not the Steiners, but the Nasties and the, the LOD doing this. Who cares at this point, you know? So, right. it was bad bad booking and bad, bad placing on the show. Yeah, that's just Hogan booking his segment on the show is what this is. So, he doesn't really care what else is on the show, and that's what happens when this, like, this shit happens. Pretty much. So post-match, as Pillman and Anderson run down, Pillman going wild, he's tripping over the guardrail, falling all over the place, chairs flying everywhere, wild swings. He actually nails Macho Man in the eye, and it reportedly gives the Macho Man a black eye from one of Pillman's wild swings. So it's Flair and Savage and Pillman and Arn versus Hogan and the Macho Man and Big Booty Brother Man on his way down to try to even the odds just a little bit as they chase the heels out of the ring, but Arn signals to the back. He's motioning, come on out. And as the cameras pan to the aisle, holy shit, it's Zeus. And I'm not going to lie, I marked out back in 1996 when Zeus appeared on my TV screen for the first time since No Holds Barred. It really is 1989 again here with the Mega Powers. (laughs) I got to tell you, this is the missing piece. Now we have Hogan and Savage and Beefcake and Zeus all out here at the same time as he has the word gangsta written in white paint. On the side of his head, looks absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. As he's his pants pulled up to his, his tits as well, a la Hawk, if you will. And a fucking tank. Of course, he was Jeep Swinson. Should have been called Tank Swinson. I don't know that there was a guy bigger than this. Like, when I first saw him here, when this happened, when he first came out back in 1996, I was like, there is no human being with a bigger chest than this. Impossible. This guy is a oh, fucking man. monster. He is. It's impressive. I don't, 
I'm sure everybody's seen him and know what he looks like. He just reminds me of like somebody coming from those world's strongest man competitions. Yeah, yeah. It's the first thing I and, think of. And he's like, it's like, holy shit! You shouldn't. You're not allowed to be that big. Your well, he wasn't allowed to be that big, Steve. That. That's why he passed away from being that big. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, but man, like, I don't know, man. It's 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 insane to look like that. And you can't they, just like I can't go out and do that. No, you can't. Even if I wanted to jack myself with as many steroids as I want, like your body has to be built that way already to a degree. You just got to enhance yeah. it, and that's what he did. And that's those are some damn good genes. Uh, he didn't need any of that shit. That was that was it's uh, sick and ridiculous. I thought he looked awesome though way back when. Obviously, he was immobile <laughs> and couldn't really do much. But I, I remember seeing him in world class. He come yeah. out with I think Gary Hart and his military fatigues he's about to right. bust out of that shirt i was like man this dude is massive right I'm surprised vince never tried him or get him yeah that's a good point it really is i'm i'm shocked at that as well um so we close the show the baby faces are backing down a little bit who are these guys and even the announcers and tony shivani has to play tony shivani was in the wwf in 89 for fuck's sakes and even he has to play off like they've never seen these guys before uh, even though it's clear one of them is fucking Zeus. <laughs> Everybody knows what, who Zeus is that's watching wrestling. Uh, Tony Schiavone interviews Team Flair, or the Alliance to End Hulkamania, if you will. They hard sell the Doomsday Cage match coming up this Sunday at the Uncensored pay-per-view. All of these men and maybe more at Uncensored. What a clusterfuck. At this point, we know it's Hogan and Savage versus whoever the fuck shows up. It's like a pickup game of fucking basketball, Steve. Yeah, it's crazy. Bischoff is doing a hard sell. Like, Raman may be uncensored. He's boys with Hogan. He may be suspended from NBA, but he's not suspended from wrestling and playing off of that. I thought that was kind of shitty. That Now, that to me is blatant. Right. Having a match scheduled and then something happens or you just don't want to do it, whatever. That That's whatever. That's wrestling. But when you're blatantly name-dropping a guy that you know is not going to get anywhere near this pay-per-view just to try and sell buys. Like somebody might be, might hear that, but man, is Rodman really going to show up? Like what the hell's going to happen? I got to see this. Like right. that's shitty blatantly doing that. That's ridiculous. Um, I thought that was terrible, but it is what it is, man. This match, the, the match is a cluster. It's shit. <laughs> the build to it is shit. Uh, the best part about this whole part right here is, uh, when he gets on the mic before he gets interviewed, he's like, uh, get in the ring. He, he's like standing in the ring behind these big dudes and Hogan and them are high telling it out of there. And he gets on the mic and says, do something about it. Yeah. I love <laughs> in it in a way that only Ric Flair can. It comes as cloth. It's so, it comes across so great. I'm like, man, that is sweet. It was a great line. And I, I don't, you can only say so much about how terrible this whole, it's utter shit. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with you. And, you know, Zeus is, uh, you know, shit. And I'm sure he's even far was here in 96 and he wasn't 89, but still the mark in me, was marking out that Zeus is back on the TV screen. Never mind the fact that when he was on TV in 1989, all I wanted was for him to go away. It was still kind of cool to see him here just pop back up. My childhood relived. I'm, I'm nine and 10 years old again. I remember calling my brother the next day. He didn't have cable at the time. And I had to call him and tell him, you'll never believe who's in WCW now. Fucking Zeus. He goes, Zeus, Zeus. Isn't like we, we got, we popped as if like, you know, the warrior came back or something just because it was another name from a bygone time period, you know? Never mind the fact that he sucked. Yeah. It was just cool that Zeus was there, <laughs> even if it was for like I one week. I love Zeus, man. <laughs> I, I loved him. Like it, it, just that presence. Sometimes that's all you need. I mean, obviously the bell rings, and he was protected pretty well. He had some great talent to work with. Yeah, he did um, on his side and everything. So like he wasn't going to be exposed by any means. And like we talked about during the uncensored watch along over on Patreon. Vince got him at the perfect time before he was on TV doing other things and getting beat up by Ice Cube and doing all the stupid shit that he's doing and like Friday and all his other TV appearances and stuff mm -hmm. kind of devalued that that aura that right. he had in 1989. Mm -hmm. So like when he gets here, like it's like eh, that's Debo. He got his ass kicked. So like you're not really taking him. You're not taking him serious. But when Vince had him, you're like, my God, this dude is massive. He's bigger than Hogan. He's crazy. He's cross-eyed. He can't look at you straight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he just has that presence. And you only really have that once. Once you get jobbed out or look stupid, it's gone. And that's kind of how I felt here. I was like, it was cool as hell to see Zeus because I always was a fan. But 
that aura like you talked about from 89, it just wasn't there. Right. Not the same impact. What did you think, uh, as we close out this episode of Nitro, of Hogan basically changing the entire, now that you've read about it, changing the entire plan of the main event of a pay-per-view 10 days out? Not necessarily because it was for the better, adding Savage and some other shit to, to make it a little you know, more confusing, and maybe you don't realize how awful this thing really sucks because there's so much shit going on. But what did you think of Hogan just <laughs> doing shit like this out of the blue? It's supposed to be one match, 10 days out, he changes it to a completely different match, and he walks in and tells the guys in charge, Bischoff, Sullivan, whoever, hey, this is not what we're doing anymore. We're doing this. And they basically just have to comply. I don't necessarily have an issue with it. I think when you give a guy that, that much control, you reap what you sow. I mean, somebody needs to check Hogan at the door immediately and be like, look, I'm the boss here. You're doing what we say. This is what we got planned, and it's not changing. If you don't do that, and you let him get away with one thing, he's just going to take advantage of the next thing and the next thing. And by the time it's over, you've created a monster that you really can't control. So who's the boss? So it's like me, I look at it from that aspect. I think it's their problem that they did it. I will say, did he really change it for the worse? I mean, yeah, there may be four more guys in this match involved, but you also got Macho Man added in. So like, I'd much rather see Macho and Hogan against eight guys than Hogan against four guys. Oh, I'm not arguing that. I just I, mean that he's he's running around changing main events of pay per views ten days out just because, brother. I mean, it's well, I, mean, I, mean, I guess I, he enhanced it. I think. I mean, if he, if he said if he's going to have a Doomsday Cage and then a week out he comes in and says I'm not doing this cage match. I just want a tag match, or I want all four of them by myself in the ring and they're just going to job to me. That's one that that'd be terrible and ridiculous and out of control. And somebody would hopefully hope to God say something or maybe Ric Flair stroke his ego and do his own thing. Right. So I don't I don't really necessarily have an issue with what he did, even if it's a week out. Like it, whoever was going to buy that pay-per-view was going to buy it anyway. And if you tell me that I'm going to get four more guys and then you got Zeus and this other big ass. <laughs> I, I don't have an issue with it at all. All right, that's fair. Uh, what about the other part here? Uh, Hogan basically calling Bischoff or whoever he needs to call and telling them that they, they need to get Pillman back on the road immediately, uh, stop working the gimmick, the crazy gimmick, the everything that's going on, everything they've been building to for weeks, if not months, with Brian Pillman. Hogan decides, nope, I want I want this guy in the cage match on Sunday so I can, I can beat him because he's over, brother. Uh, you don't think that's a little bit of too much uh, power? When you can do things like this, just squash something else that you're doing with the company, inside the company with another character, of course, Hogan sees, you know, it's over, or whatever you want to call it, whatever's good, everybody's paying attention to it, that's obvious. Yeah, I, that, that's me, that's, that's, that's shitty. Uh, I'm of the belief that it is completely, I'm, it's probably because I'm not in the wrestling business, I don't know how these people, I'm not wired like these people, uh, I probably wouldn't be a good fit in wrestling. But the way I look at things is if somebody can make money for the company and is successful for the company, then why the hell are you stopping it? If you're going to let it, if a dude's getting over naturally, why would you put a stop to it? Are you that scared of your position, that, that weak minded that you can't handle somebody else getting some, some love or getting over himself? That, that part bothers me. I will say though, during this segment, when he came out and he was just falling all over the place and looking ridiculous and, People were dragging him. He didn't really want to get hit. He wasn't doing anything. I felt, I thought it looked, it was very, very flat just because he was falling all over the place. Nothing right. could be connected. Nothing was being done. Obviously connected with Savage's face, but um, <laughs> uh, it, it just looked terrible. Like when the dude's falling off, flailing and falling all over the place and tripping over his feet and, and things like that, it's just, it looked really bad. And this is kind of when, Pillman was on the downturn for me as far as this gimmick went anyway. But yeah, I don't I don't like that. I, I feel like you need all the horses you can get to be over. And if you're just going to blatantly try to squash somebody and kill all momentum that he has just because of your ego, that's shitty. And right. there's plenty of guys in this business that do that. This ain't yeah. just a Hogan thing. <laughs> no, but Hogan's insecurity here in 96 is just uh, insanely level, insane it's, levels. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. I'll play devil's advocate. I know most people shit on Hogan, and rightfully so. I don't care. But I'll play devil's advocate here. I feel like if 
if you was on top of the world as long as he was, and you've been told by everybody that you're you're the reason wrestling is what it is, and then all of a sudden you come back and you go to a new company, new grounds, and it's just not working anymore. I'd have a hard time accepting that too. Like it'd be tough mentally. And, I'd argue um, that this this wasn't working for the last from the uh, get go. No, I mean this even wasn't even, even the, the last get-go. little bit in the WWF. I, I I would argue that it really. Oh, wasn't. I agree. Like like it it ran its course. And right. he was probably what ninety six. I would say he was about two years <laughs> too late turning heel. I feel like I at think least he done it earlier. At least, yeah, at least two years. I mean, ninety three was a wash. He was gone after what June, and we didn't see him till July of ninety four. So that year there, whatever. If he would have came into WCW as a heel, like an outsider, that would have been kind of cool, and it probably would have worked. So that's, that's I don't know, man. You just it, something to think about. You just look. You just lose whatever it was that was getting you over, and it's just gone. And people change, and the crowd changes, but he doesn't really adapt to it. So, like right. mentally, I'd be I'd be in the same sort of state. I don't know if I would be trying to squash everything that's getting over, or doing the things <laughs> that he's doing uh, to get myself back over. But mentally, that has to be hard to accept. How do you accept that? Yeah, I, was, I guess. I, I mean, it, eight, it doesn't it doesn't years, hurt that you know? you know it doesn't hurt that Hogan's one of the ultimate carnies of his era as well. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> Segment of the night, man. Is it uh, Lex Luger and his uh, big-time win over Loch Ness? The Steiners against Public Enemy? The Roadies and the Nasties? The Shaker Booty Tour with the Booty Man? Or the Tornado Tag, brother? I really like the Luger stuff. You know that. Um, I thought he did excellent. He's probably the best part of the whole show uh, as an individual performer, I will say. Um, it's just so damn funny. I'm, I'm going to go with the Steiners and Public Enemy. I, I love the Public Enemy from ECW. I really get into them there. Their promos are some of the best stuff. I love them in that sense. But um, seeing them put on a decent match with the Steiners, uh, they made them work. They look good. And I, to be honest with you, the Steiners are the best tag team in WCW right now at this point. Oh, yeah. They, they've, uh, they've, they've been, been here for, for, two been weeks, for two weeks. And they've had <laughs> good matches they've already, with two of the teams that haven't had a good match yet. So yeah, <laughs> probably like ten years. So right. probably about six years. So yeah, yeah they they yeah, they've been it's gone. amazing. They mm-hmm. just come right in and since late ninety two, pick up right where they left off, right? And just beat the shit out of these guys, and they're the best. Nasty suck. The roadies are over the hill, and to me that leaves like the Steiners and Harlem Heat. I, I did feel like this show was lackluster, and it was just cluster after cluster after cluster. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't very good. No, yeah. If you watch the first two segments, I'm I'm good after that. Lex Luger and then the Steiners and Public Enemy. I too am yeah. going to go with Steiners and Public Enemy. Although I think I enjoyed the Lex Luger spot even more. I got, I got more of a kick out of it, but it's just so quick and there's no wrestling. Yeah. I just feel like it's not fair. So I think Steiners and Public Enemy put on the best wrestling match on the show. Either way, though, I think both segments were the the best things and the only good things on the entire show. Really. Yep. That's. I mean, you can watch the first bout. 15 minutes of Nitro if you have the commercials still. And uh, you can turn it off after that. You ain't missed. Nope. Agreed. And we move on to WWF news for March of 1996. March Madison Square Garden show. The show drew approximately 17,000 for a building that was set up for 16,227 capacity. They realized that adding tickets at the last minute and there were uh, more people turned away at the door even. So they're doing really good here. Business is picking up all around, not just ratings, but also at the house shows, at least at least in the major market of Madison Square Garden there. Well, that's pretty cool for them. I was skimming the Observer, and they made a point going into WrestleMania that Bret Hart was in the main event spots and was the headliner of a lot of these shows that were really drawing well. So it was kind of, they were, you knew where they're going. They knew where they were going. They wasn't really going to change it. I think they were questioning it a little bit just because of how good the houses were. Yeah, it makes you wonder who who really was drawing that. I think it was a combination just of all the big names involved. It wasn't just the Bret Hart or just the Shawn Michaels or just the Diesel. It was all of the above and the Undertaker. I mean, that's a hell of a main event. <laughs> those four guys, and you didn't get that a lot back in those days. No, definitely not. Over in the USWA, the big news on this week's television was an appearance by Mankind, Cactus Jack from the WWF, who headlined in challenging Jerry Lawler for the unified title. On the March 18th, a Memphis show, which is also the March 18th Monday Night Raw episode. 
Kind of funny to see uh, Jerry Lawler working Mankind over in Memphis, getting him ready for the World Wrestling Federation debut. Oh, yeah, of course. That's the stomping ground. That's the the way in, I guess. They stop there before they get to the events, which yeah, is pretty was, cool. That's, yeah, it was a I fun time. That. It was a fun time. when uh, the, You know, the first time I knew about the WWF-USWA trade, the, the way they were started trading talent and the relationship they had was the after mags. You go to the middle of the pages there where they have the, the ring results, and you go in there, and you start reading the USWA results, and you see all these WWF names on the card, and it's like, what the hell is going on? Or maybe you read a, a WWF show that's you know in the Memphis or Kentucky area, and you see Jeff Jarrett's on the card, and it's it's really, I mean, it's really, I'm not 96, I'm talking about way back you know, in the 93, 94 when they first started working with the company, but it was really like, wow, this is really different you know different time and it's it kind of cool to see they're still doing it here all the way here in 96 obviously they did it with the nation and otherwise as well yeah definitely there's a lot of that stuff out there pretty cool for sure it is expected that after the germany tour which follows wrestlemania that bret hart will take an extended hiatus to concentrate on acting as he has been offered to do more episodes of lonesome dove the tv program i never watched that show although i do know they were they were pretty big on uh, putting over the Bret Hart was on this program. I think Bret thought this was the uh, beginning of his Hollywood tenure in, in the in the business. Or not wrestling business, but just in his business, in, in his career. Yeah. I mean, he had a good look. He had a look that could work in Hollywood a little bit as long as he could act. But Well, there you go. That, that, that that's the problem. That. Yeah, that was the <laughs> problem there. No, no facials, no personality, and no. <laughs> Bret Hart's happy face was the same as his... Angry face, I think, at times. Uh, I don't know if Bret Hart... Had, did Bret Hart have a happy face beyond the 1980s, at least? Um, <laughs> definitely not when he gets to WCW. <laughs> no, definitely definitely not by then. And, <laughs> Maybe in 93 or so, 90, 94. I don't mm. know. He, he might have done that knows. little smirk, the smirk. I'll give him the smirk. Yeah. That Bret, that Bret smirk. We'll go on to Monday Night Raw for March 18th. We're back taped on March 11th from the Freeman Coliseum, San Antonio. Clips from Madison Square Garden show Diesel and Shawn Michaels. It's post-match after the match against The Undertaker and Bret Hart. Diesel actually attacks both Bret and The Undertaker, as well as his own partner, Shawn Michaels, with the steel chair. We'll see a little more about that later on in the show as we kick things off. Jake the Snake Roberts in the ring taking on the British Bulldog, accompanied by Jim Cornette. And uh, immediately on the commentary, they're ripping into the recent Tyson fight for being a quick, no-action match or they did that quite often every time tyson had a match in the 90s most of the time they never really went beyond the first round uh if not the first minute and so they uh, they always uh, took this liberty to say we promise you more action which they could do because this is a worked program so they know they're giving you more action than a minute or one round so yes they can guarantee you that but at the same time they took liberties at, at boxing at this point especially the tyson fights which were over in a heartbeat and here we see the Bulldog. He blocks a DDT early on. Rams Jake backwards into the buckle to take over uh, control. Jim Cornette, even with a cheap shot with the tennis racket. Jake makes the comeback, though. But Cornette distracts the referee. Jake slides over the Bulldog. Lands the DDT. But Cornette pulls him off during the cover. Somehow the referee misses that. And out comes a snake. Not the albino python, though. Jake goes out, grabs his uh, snake, rips it out of the bag. But it's not revelations or whatever the hell he's calling it these days. Meanwhile, he chases Cornette away, but winds up getting counted out. Even though I wasn't really expecting an awesome finish here, I thought this was ass. <laughs> match went about four minutes, 51 seconds. Bulldog picks up the win in a nothing match. Yeah, it was shit. Jake Roberts, I have no idea how he lasted through summer Survivor Series, actually. Hell yeah, he may even be in the Royal Rumble in 97. I can't remember. Yeah, but, he is. He is. Um, yeah, You're giving him too much credit, though. He kind of disappears after SummerSlam, reappears out of nowhere at Survivor Series, then reappears at Royal Rumble. He's, he's reappearing at the pay-per-views. He's not necessarily getting pushed or yeah. used. But, yeah, I agree with you. I don't know how the hell he makes it all the way King of the even, Ring? I don't, even know why they, <laughs> I don't even know why they would even give it to him at Survivor Series yeah. or the Royal Rumble. That's right. terrible. And we'll talk about that later on some more. I don't know if it's this episode or the next one, but... Yoko Zuna beats him to the ring. Oh, that you beat my notes. Up. You beat me to my notes. <laughs> that sums up Jake's tenure here when he came back. Just complete garbage. He's out of shape. 
he never gets into shape and he's just terrible. And he called, I guess recently, I think he's called Vince an asshole for, um, the SummerSlam shit the, doing, with Lawler doing the SummerSlam. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, Vin, Jake, you're an asshole for stealing money for Vince McMahon for a year here. You're, you're an asshole for a lot of reasons, Jake. We can go. I mean, I mean, all the, de- the derogatory things he said about so many other guys after passing that it's just like he who cast the first stone. No, I get it. I absolutely get it with Jake the Snake Roberts. Um, I love that he came back. I was excited, like I said, at the Royal Rumble when I saw him, and I was I was hyped, and the hype train ended <laughs> at some point. I, I may have bought it up till WrestleMania. I was just kind of hoping things would turn around, and they, they never really did. And by King of the Ring, I was questioning why, how, why why is he in this you know, position? Yeah, and then at SummerSlam, it was embarrassing. And he's blaming Vince. It's, uh, Jake, you gotta, you got to agree to do these things, buddy. So you got to own up to your part. Well, Vin, I always feel like Vince takes liberties when it comes to these alcoholic gimmicks. I, I hated it with Scott Hall. I remember reading somewhere that, you know, Scott Hall, when at that time he was on some medication that if he got near alcohol, it made him vomit. And I'm, I'm sure they weren't using real alcohol. Maybe they were. I don't know. But I don't know why you, you're, a dude's trying to get clean and he's trying to help himself. Why are you putting him through this sort of angle? So I, I agree with Jake. It's tasteless. It's stupid. It's a waste of time. And it probably shouldn't have been done. But at the same time, Jake, you just stole money for a year. You never got into shape. You never took it serious, this return. This could have, he could have been huge when he came back. He got a massive pop. The, cr- the, crowd, the crowd was and, waiting uh, for him to turn that corner. He just never turned I, I that I think corner. everybody was waiting for him to get to that old Jake, get in shape, get a little tan on, and, and get back to normal a little bit. But he never did it. So Vince is probably looking at him like, yeah, dude, that's not you for nothing. You're, you're getting this shit. I don't know, man. You get what you deserve. It's more uh, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart training videos. We see Shawn Michaels training with Jose Lothario. They're in the gym. They're getting ready for WrestleMania. Shawn Michaels going to try to realize that boyhood dream and defeat Bret Hart for the world title. On the opposite end, it's Bret Hart in training, and he's in the snow, and as you pointed out last episode, in those sweatpants running the roads. I, I thought it was hilarious. Is, um, they started showing clips of Bret Hart's house, and this is the early part of 1996. And all over his walls in the early part of 1996, before he's even fucking retired from the business, he has world titles plastered to his walls. He has pictures of himself in magazines plastered to the walls, toys on the, on the mantle. I just, I, I understand you want to defend him. It's Bret Hart. It's your dude. But I, I can't, def- this is, I, I could have my, it could be my biggest hero in the world. This is complete, just fucking pathetic. I mean, uh, I don't even know. This might not even be the word I'm looking for right now. It's it's sad. It really is. Like, this is your world. Not so much like, hey, kids, we're grandkids. I retired 20 years ago. This is everything your grandpa did on the wall. You know, oh, wow, that's great, grandpa. No, dude, you're still actively the world fucking champion right now. And you have this shit on the wall praising yourself. It's a shrine to Bret Hart. And he's still active. He's an active competitor. I, I know you've made excuses for him in the past. I, I just can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not excuses, man. I mean, he did. That's I don't. I don't know. It's just Vent a uh, Brett. That's how he's wired. <laughs> I mean, Hogan has a shrine to himself. I'm sure he collected things on the on his way. Had a room in his house, an office with things. I mean, I've seen his. I, I can't even Brett compare Hogan's Hulk Hogan to Bret Hart. I, I I don't even like Hulk Hogan. I've I like seen, Bret Hart more than Hulk Hogan. I've seen Hogan. And I still can't compare I've seen the Hogan two. Shrine of himself. I can't he has a whole room of like every collectible that ever came out of himself. Hulk Hogan display. probably made sixty gazillion dollars wrestling more but, than Bret Hart. But is, who? That's irrelevant. That's oh, irrelevant. It's totally, totally relevant. <laughs> totally relevant. It's like Bret Hart. Who so are you, saying, dude? So you're saying a, a guy who? That's crazy. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't matter how much money you've made in the business. I think it, I think it matters it, it, overall of what you are, what you've uh, accomplished in the world. I mean, my grandma knew who Hulk Hogan was. She didn't watch wrestling. She wouldn't have had a damn fucking clue who the hell Bret Hart. Well, what the hell's a Bret Hart? And uh, let's be fair, I don't like Hulk Hogan. I don't. I'm not a Hulk Hogan guy at all. I don't, I don't own a piece of Hulkamania merchandise, mind you. And I did. I did not? purchase Bret Hart sunglasses, not because of Bret Hart. It's because the sunglasses are damn cool. I'm not defending. I'm not saying anything, but I, it shouldn't matter what status you are in wrestling. I mean, I, if if some, I'm sure like guys today keep all their things. 
Uh, way yeah, a lot of a lot of marks for themselves like, today too, though. It's, it's another problem we have. Like Sting's never really drew anything. To quote Tracy Smothers, yeah. "Do you remember when the marks were in the crowd and not in the ring?" <laughs> the great line that Tracy Smothers used to say. Uh, I mean, Sting has uh, every one of his suits. I'm sure he has a bunch of merchandise. Oh, well, you want to keep your own gear. I, I have no problem with Bret things Hart. like that. I don't have problems with Bret Hart keeping his collectibles. Just a shrine in 1996. I mean, you're still active. It's just a, a bit over the top. Are you going to well. store it away in storage and bust it out when you finally retire? Like, I, I don't know. That's He's proud of what he did. There's nothing wrong with that. I guess. I mean, I just uh, I find it odd if I was walking to somebody's house that had accomplishments and they, they have them everywhere I walk. It's just kind of creepy to me. But Brett does admit in this promo that He's been getting beaten down by guys like Diesel and The Undertaker throughout the last several months. Well, Shawn Michaels decided to take a hiatus after getting beaten down by those thugs in Syracuse. This is not a dancing contest. This is not an uh, uh, Iron Man dance-off, uh, so to speak, I guess is the best way he put that. He says Shawn's cockiness, cockiness is his ignorance, and Brett is the better role model here. I don't know that either are really a role model, but... Brett feels like he is. I, th- I felt like a lot of this promo was just more of the same. Brett Hart telling it the way he really feels, not necessarily a um, a work, if you will. I think that's how Brett Hart always did his stuff. I mean, he always it always felt authentic and real with Brett. Uh, he was just going to voice his opinion, whether he liked it or not. Um, depending on who he was, it didn't matter who he was in the ring with, whether he was a good guy, bad guy indifferent i mean i've been watching like superstars 94 and watching the build to wrestlemania 10 and he's even i mean he, he's the same there as he is here he, he says stuff you know i respect you and i like you but you you're good luger but you you're not you don't have the experience that i do in this situation or something like that well i don't remember but he's always done this so it was just it just it's Bret Hart. That's just who he is. That's how his promos were, and it didn't matter who he's going against. What are you watching these '94 shows on? <laughs> I got my ways. Oh, what a shady character here! <laughs> so, uh, well, a couple uh, of them were on uh, on the WWE Network. If you want to oh, watch right, those, right. yeah, they did add a couple there. That's right. It moves into '94. Now I was just curious. There's just so much other crap we've we're reviewing right now. I'm like, what the hell? Do you have time to do that too? Yeah, well, I, I work. I can't. I can't take notes while I'm working. So I can oh, have wrestling not. and stuff. While I'm you watch working, wrestling while so. you work, Steve. Don't admit that to your boss. They will not like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say I don't. They don't know any different. <laughs> but we have uh, uh, the Ultimate Warrior video, the same one we've been getting. Warriors headed back at WrestleMania. Gold Dust in the ring taking on Fa Two. Goldie wrestles here in a kilt. Obviously, uh, building up to the Roddy Piper match at WrestleMania. Fa Two actually spanks Gold Dust in the match repeatedly. While Roddy Piper calls in on the phone, talks about the backlot brawl, which is now confirmed for WrestleMania 12. It's Gold Dust and Roddy Piper in the backlot brawl. Running Diamond Cutter by Fatu during the match and a top rope splash, but he misses. And Gold Dust nails the Lariat, turns Fatu inside out because Fatu wouldn't have it any other way. He loves taking that bump. And uh, Gold Dust dips down, squats down. Straddles and dances, I guess if you want to call it a dance, Steve, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, over Fatu's face. And the curtain call ends it in a matter of five minutes here. I wrote, wow, because once Goldust took back over, he just kind of squashed Fatu. Really surprising. Yeah, it ended in a flash. I mean, Fatu got his offense and some spots in, but yeah. like you said, as soon as Goldust took over, it was over. I liked it. It was a, it was a solid TV match. Yeah, I think what threw me off was Fatu was always, I don't want to say an upper mid Carter, but he was an upper, you know, he was an upper echelon mid guy. And not, I wasn't surprised that he lost by any means. He needed to do the job here for Goldust, but it was the delay in between the Lariat and then he kind of danced his crotch all over Fatu's face for a good minute before he does his finisher, which I thought was a, a little bit much time wise, I guess is what threw me off, I guess, here. Not, not, not the pinfall loss. I got that. Yeah. I think it was just Goldust didn't really get anything in to enhance his gimmick like that. So he's like, okay, I'm going to grind over Fatu <laughs> here for a minute and then do the curtain call. So we got a Warrior video before the Goldust match, and we get a, another Warrior video after the Goldust match. This time we go back to WrestleMania 7 as we see the Warrior defeat the Macho King at the time, Randy Savage. And it's promo time. Vince McMahon in the ring with Jim Cornette, Owen Hart, the British Bulldog, and Vader. 
We go back to superstars for a moment. We see Jake the Snake Roberts issue a six-man tag team challenge. Jake, Ahmed, and Yoko look to take on Camp Cornet at WrestleMania. Camp Cornet accepts the challenge. Owen Hart says he carried Yokozuna for their time as a tag team, and the Bulldog is much stronger than Ahmed Johnson. Cornet runs down Yoko, alludes that Mr. Fuji was put in the hospital with a knee injury. Somehow he was, well, he fell down the stairs, says Cornette, but they allude that maybe Jim Cornette had, had something to do with that Fuji bump down those stairs. And apparently it is Vader time, they say on the way out. And on the video wall, it's Jake, Ahmed, and Yokozuna popping up. They announce that if they win, Yokozuna will get five minutes with Jim Cornette. You'd figure, Steve, after Jim Cornette managing all these years, he'd look at those fine prints in the, in the contracts here. Yokozuna then bonsai drops a balloon with Jim Cornette's face attached. I like that. Jim Cornette goes ballistic in the ring, and they remind him to next time read the fine print. So it's six-man tag team action at WrestleMania, and should the baby faces win, Yoko gets five minutes with Jim Cornette. That had to be fun for the fans. Yeah, it just adds a little little heat to that match. I mean, there's already a lot of angles and things like that to get it going, but you know, seeing Cornette possibly get his ass kicked by Yokozuna uh, just adds a little in, more intrigue and you kind of hope that it happens for Yoko's sake to get his hands on Cornette finally. So uh, I thought it was a great addition to the match. We get more highlights from Madison Square Garden, that tag team main event I mentioned. It was Diesel and Sean taking on Brett and The Undertaker. Of course, Diesel turned, or not turned, but attacked Brett and Taker post-match with a steel chair after Brett actually pinned Diesel in the finish. But that wasn't the big note here. The big note was he turned on his own buddy, Shawn Michaels, blasted him with a chair as well. And then we hear footage of Shawn as, uh, as he's leaving the ring. Says he's going to ki- kick Diesel's seven-foot ass. So up until this point, Diesel slowly made the heel turn. Slowly turned on one baby face after another after another. But he still remained, eh, what do you want to say, 20% baby face? Simply because he aligns himself with one of the top faces as well as good buddy. Shawn Michaels. Now he's turned on Shawn. Now Diesel going into WrestleMania as as needed is a full blown heel here. Yeah, I like it. I was I was intrigued with this Diesel run right here because I, I liked the heel turn and I was excited to kind of see where he was going. And then obviously he's not around much longer, so uh, it's unfortunate. It'd have been cool to see, like I said, where he was heading, what he was doing. I know we got the match at In Your House with Shawn, but after that it's pretty much over. So. I think that, to be honest with you, that could have been the best part of it, and it would have just been a little bit down towards the middle of the pack a little bit, probably devalued some for a little bit, because there's really just not a lot of top faces for him to go against at that point. Right. With Brett leaving and things like that, so I just don't know where you go. So it's probably good that he left. They did a great job of slowly turning him, and then finally uh, he beats up his buddy You know, a couple weeks before WrestleMania in the biggest match of his career, so... Very good job here. Uh, thankfully, Vince didn't get bitter and shitty with Diesel like he did Hall. So, right, Diesel's lucky he's fighting Undertaker. <laughs> right, yeah, that's what I. I think I mentioned that either last episode or the episode where I think the only reason he didn't get screwed like Hall was because he was working Taker and Taker. I'm sure Taker didn't have to go to Vince and say, "Don't fuck with my match," but I think Vince just out of respect to Taker didn't fuck with his match. As I think that's the only yeah. thing Diesel had going for him there. Yeah. Like I said, lucky diesel. <laughs> he would yeah, be, and I agree with you. And it's not in my notes, but I agree with you 100%. Like, I was thinking the same thing as you were saying it. Once he wrestled Sean, it would have been downhill there for diesel. Yeah. You know, he only had good yeah, matches with the guys that uh, could give you a good match. And that's Brett gave him a good match at Survivor Series. Sean gives him a great match here uh, upcoming at In Your House. And I'm not saying the Undertaker match was a good match, but that's a big Name match. Big time one, match, yeah. Once you've it's done all that, you're, there's really nothing, there's nowhere else for you to go unless yeah, you no, recycle, other, so. Yeah, the only the only other positive, too, is Sean's his buddy. <laughs> so right. Sean's not going to, I'm not working you because you're going to WCW. I'm getting you one last match before you get the hell out of here. So yeah, I want to have a good match. He right, had that so. going for him. He had that going for him, too. So right place, right time for Diesel. Just unfortunate for Hall <laughs> or Razor. Yeah. <laughs> We go to the ring, and it's Big Daddy Cool Diesel taking on Barry Horowitz as Diesel heads out to the ring. He looks underneath the ring. He looks underneath the apron. He's looking for the Undertaker under the ring down there. After attacking Paul Bear last week, Diesel's a little bit worried about what could be coming his way. Paul Bear actually winds up bringing a casket to ringside. 
during the match, which distracts Big Daddy Cool and allows Barry Horner with some offensive blows. Well, at least some punches, some forearms, things like that. He wasn't exactly taking Diesel down to the mat, but Barry did his best. But Diesel comes back, reverses an Irish whip. Big Boot gets a two count. But Diesel's constantly focusing his eyes on that casket at ringside. So he merely pounds Barry Horowitz on the ground with a couple more punches, makes the cover. It was a funny finish. He, he booted him. Horowitz kicks out. So he just punches him and gets the win here in two minutes and five seconds. What the big news here is, though, it's in the post-match shenanigans. Vince McMahon sells that the Undertaker is in that casket. And he does that from the time they push it out. You know who's in there. You know it's the Undertaker's in there. And I think Diesel's thinking the same thing. So he goes over the timekeeper. He grabs the wrench from ringside. And Diesel slowly walks over to the casket, opens up the casket, waiting to hit the Undertaker. But it's not the Undertaker, Steve. It's a replica. It's a guy dressed up exactly like, and he kind of looks like in the face. They did a good camera shot of this guy who is made up to look exactly like Diesel. So basically what Diesel sees in the casket is his own dead body as gongs begin to play over the announcers, uh, over the speakers. So Diesel cautiously then leaves ringside after seeing himself dead in the casket. Uh, It's really cool. I really liked this angle as a kid. I thought it was uh, clever. It was always a guy in there. Uh, you just train to know, like, if a casket comes down. He did it with Yoko. He probably, I think he did it with Mabel and Kama, too, probably. So I think it, you just train to know that Undertaker's in the casket when it's rolling down there. So to see your own self laying in the casket, that has to be eerie as shit. I don't care who you are. I know it's an angle. But I, I, don't, I don't think I'd ever want to see myself looking dead in a casket. Um, save that for when I really am dead. Very cool, very clever, different, and uh, Diesel did an excellent job of selling it. So uh, this was a great angle. I liked it. Yeah, I remember when I watched it, I think the first question on my mouth was, who was that? Who did they get to to put in there? Because obviously I was smart by then, but at the same time it was very different. Definitely never been done before. And it was really cool that they found you know something to look identical to Kevin Nash. I thought, I thought they did a really good job with the story here. I always thought it was just a dummy, like a mannequin or something. No, no, it was Kevin Nash. Definitely. I'm just, uh, I just, I was always pumped though. I thought it was a great job. I thought the idea, again, they've been doing this, thinking outside the box a lot lately. Mm-hmm. Doing those first time things that you haven't really seen or don't see a lot. Really, really good job. We're about to get going here with WWF champion Bret Hart taking on Tatanka. But right before we see the match, Ted DiBiase is in the backstage. He's talking with Tatanka about the match, but one, two, three kid is back there too. They may be planning something. They catch the cameraman sneaking into the dressing room. They boot the cameraman out, so maybe they're foreshadowing things to come here in a few moments. So we get Bret Hart here this week taking on Tatanka, but we learn next week it's Shawn Michaels against Al Snow, now Leaf Cassidy of the new and improved Rockers. Also Ahmed versus Owen next week, but the big news here to me was, or the big sell here was, we have Bret in action this week and Shawn next week leading into WrestleMania. We saw them both a week or two ago on the same show wrestling very talented competition. And now again, they're separated here week to week, but they continue to build every segment builds to WrestleMania. Really good job here, I thought. As Bret Hart heads to the ring to take on Tatanka. Bret works on the arm. Tatanka comes back with a short arm clothesline. And he takes over as the one, two, three kid comes to ringside. Tatanka gets heat before Bret comes back with the five moves of doom. Brett tries to apply the sharpshooter, but DiBiase up on the apron. And as DiBiase distracts Earl Hebner, the one, two, three kid jumps up into the apron, distracts Bret Hart, grabs him, holds him for Tatanka to take a cheap shot. But Brett moves, and Tatanka collides with the kid, and Brett rolls him up. Schoolboy. It gets the win in eight minutes. I kind of wish Brett had just beat Tatanka outright clean at this point, because clearly Tatanka's on his way out the door. But other than that, um, it was it was a match. It was another Tatanka match here in 96. I thought Tatanka came to work tonight. I thought it was a decent match for TV. Uh, Brett switched up the finish a little bit and did something a little different. He got the roll up. And I, I mentioned it, I think, last week. Brett did not like to build the WrestleMania 12. He wasn't getting big wins. He wasn't getting strong strong wins. And this is one of those matches where he, yeah. he beats a guy with a roll up. Like, he didn't even get that solid finish of a sharpshooter submission like to really 
sell home, sell that point. I think that was Sean my problem here. Guys. This is Brett's last last big match as champion going into the pay per view. He needed a big finish here, and they give him a schoolboy. But not just a schoolboy. They give him a schoolboy against Tatanka, who's been doing jobs to the DDT and the Tombstone, and you know anybody anybody else who wants to put him away with the finisher. So I was kind of bummed that Brett couldn't put Tatanka away. But at least I'm not even saying he had to do the sharpshooter. I get it was a big deal to submit back then. Maybe you know one of Brett's other five moves, just something. You know what I mean? Other than a schoolboy, I would have yeah. liked to have seen a more definitive win for Brett going into the pay per view. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and- You've already stated your opinion on Brett and I defend him, but he ain't wrong in the way this was built. You could clearly tell uh, one guy was on the downside, the other guy was on the uptick, and it's very, very, very visible on which side is which. And um, uh, to me, like it didn't matter to me back then. I didn't care enough to pay attention to all that. Uh, I didn't realize it, to be honest. But looking back on it now, I can see why. I mean, it kind of takes away from the match even a little bit for me now compared to then. Just because one guy is built so strong and the other guy is looking weak. His training videos look like shit. They look like they're old VHS tapes copied over from like 1982 or something. Like Rocky footage. Whereas Sean looks like Drago. It's a bad feel and I can see where he's coming from. I really can. We close out this week's Raw with the final Billionaire Ted sketch, although I think it was unintentional. And see, yeah, it's Billionaire Ted at the FTC hearings. Ted was grilled on predatory practices and seemed to run his company as a monopoly. Ted simply calls it healthy competition. During the segment, Ted borrowed his answer from Jack Nicholson's testimony in A Few Good Men. They ask him, is he trying to basically end the World Wrestling Federation? They ask him for the truth. He says, you can't handle the truth, obviously. Moments later, Ted admits he was trying to put the WWF out of business and no one was going to stop him. Up on the screen, it says, to be continued, Steve, but it's never continued. We'll get to that in a little bit. After the skit, a graphic appeared on the screen regarding Turner's upcoming testimony before the FTC regarding the proposed merger between Time Warner and Turner Broadcasting, which would put Turner in control of 50% of cable outlets in the country. The graphics then read, If you share our concerns, you may make a difference. Right to Mr. Robert Potofsky in Washington, D.C. Of course, the full address they put up right on the screen. Funny for Vince to shit on monopolies and billionaires when it it didn't benefit him. Obviously, I think he'd feel a different way right now. But the the funniest part here is um, USA puts the kibosh. This is not to be continued unless you count the the free-for-all match between the Huckster and the Nacho Man, because they felt it was moving too far away from the satire and parody in which Vince McMahon promised, and it was more just a uh, personal attack from Vince on Ted Turner and Turner Broadcasting. So this is it. No more uh, Billionaire Ted sketches. Good riddance. <laughs> that yeah, was but, funny for, for the uh, most part, but yeah, the, hit or the miss. press conference sucked. Yeah, and so did this I FTC. Like the I, I didn't really care for this, yeah, this segment very either. good. No, and uh, it got serious in this one, and that's when it took away. Some of those Larry Fling lives are pretty funny with the shoe and yeah, things like that. Those were pretty clever. Um, but this one just felt too too close to the vest. It wasn't really funny. It was. I feel comedy. like it started it was, last it was week. Nothing. I feel like it started last Raw with um, the TV trivia, where he started quoting things from Ted yeah. Turner's past that he said. But I mean, that's said- not. It's they not so much a satire. Funny, I'm not saying it wasn't funny, Steve. I, I thought that yeah, was one of the yeah, better. I'm this, just saying that that's more of a personal attack one, rather than a parody, which, you know, yeah, is this what, one just felt, this one didn't even feel funny. This no, one just felt no. very, very It wasn't funny. Yeah, there was no. Overly, the, over the top. Right. Um, it looks like a few good men, like the court scene from there. So I, I think that's probably what US, USA saw as well. Like, okay, this isn't funny anymore. You're getting mad. And you're putting addresses like up on the screen. <laughs> yeah so it's, it wasn't it was it was fine but it wasn't what these all these it doesn't fit like if you put them all together and watch them back to back to back then you get to this and you're like what the hell where did the wheels fall off yeah where did the, where did this because uh, this was this was completely off off pace for right it should think. be noted it did say to be continued and it's never continued yeah. so obviously, i was wondering about that but i'm wondering if they recorded one. something and it never aired maybe a future hidden gem not necessarily probably a good future hidden gem but maybe it's out there i don't know no thanks. He's probably done. He probably done. <laughs> forgot about billionaire Ted. 
Segment of the night is it uh, Gold Dust uh, squatting over Fatu's face? The FTC Ted Turner shoot video? Bret Hart versus Tatanka? Or m- maybe the Bonsai Balloon? Jim Cornette's face. I, I, like I talked about earlier, I really, really like the angle with Diesel and Taker. It just wasn't long enough to be mm-hmm. a segment of the night. It was a great angle, but it was only like 15 seconds. So I, it's almost cheating going with that. So I am I actually really liked the Brett Tatanka match. Like I felt like Tatanka really came to work. He put on a decent match. He didn't look fat and lazy and out of shape and slow like he has for some of these other guys and just in general probably for the last half of hell. As soon as he turned heel in 94, he, yeah. probably, he went downhill after that. So yeah. um, this is probably his best match in over a year and a half. Uh, it was a decent TV match. Nothing like overly special. Um, but I just felt like Tatanka came to work and Brett got something good out of him. And the show was solid. The ending was solid, too. I thought the crowd really loved them some Bret Hart, and they thought it was a good finish with, you know, the kid getting knocked and things like that. So right. they they had a pretty loud pop for him. So I thought they ended yeah. the show well. I thought beginning to end, this was a very, very lackluster episode of Raw. I will give Vince credit. He's staying on pace. WrestleMania is... Less than two weeks away, and every single segment built to WrestleMania. I will give him all the credit in the world for that. But the show itself did nothing for me overall. I mean, there were little, like you said, little bits. Of, I like the the little Undertaker and Diesel thing. I like I like the bonsai, you know, on, on Jim Cornette, you know, <laughs> the balloon with Jim Cornette. But these were little ten second portions of the show, so I can't really give them segment of the night. So. I really, I guess I kind of have to go with Brett and Tatanka too, and I really didn't, it didn't do a whole lot for me, but I do like that Bret Hart got a decent match out of Tatanka for what it was on TV here going into WrestleMania. Not a whole lot to really brag about on this show, but it was what it was, and those ratings are in, and WCW Nitro is back, and it scores a huge rating. Doing a 3.6 and a 5.2 share, the best mark ever for a head-to-head showdown with Raw, which does a 2.9 and a 4.2 share. Let's look at that for a second. 3.6 to 2.9. That may be the widest margin yet. Nitro murders Raw this week. And the win is even more significant since it's just two weeks before WrestleMania when the WWF should theoretically be riding the momentum right in to their biggest pay-per-view of the year. Nitro doing really well this week. Yeah, I think people just missed it. So they tuned in to see what Nitro is going to do after being gone for a week. So I'm not too surprised. My real winner, I'm going to actually, I went with Raw. Um, I, I thought they did a great job of selling their matches at WrestleMania. Uh, they, they're they staying in line with what their booking is and what it should be. Fatu and Goldust was solid. Brett and Tatanka was good. Jake and Bulldog sucked, but Jake's just terrible. <laughs> um, and I just felt like Nitro had a ton of bad wrestling clusters all over the place, out of control, where your mind can't even process everything that's going on. I, I just didn't care for anything on that show. I, I think we talked about it outside of the first 15 minutes. After that, there's nothing on that show that's even worth watching, where I can at least get, you know, probably... 10 to 20 minutes solid out of this show from beginning to end throughout. There's going to be little things that pop up here and there that keep me intrigued and enjoy the mat, the whole overall show. So I'm going with raw this week. Yeah. And I am also selecting raw uh, simply because I felt like they did a good job of what they needed to do for WrestleMania. Not because it was any much of a better show. I thought neither one of these shows were really super impressive nitro or raw. But I thought Raw did what it needed to do, especially given you know WrestleMania being two weeks away. So I absolutely had to go Raw here. So I, too, will give Raw as the real winner here this week as we move on to the following Sunday night, Uncensored. And that's available right now at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. Listen to me and Steve call it as the part of the Watch Along series. All kinds of fun there, the Doomsday Cage match. All kinds of not fun there, the Chicago Street Fight. But we called it all, and we stayed awake somehow, right through the whole thing. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. You guys go check it out at WrestleCopia, or excuse me, at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. as part of the $5 all-access tier and all of the watch-along series. It was it was entertaining outside of that Chicago street fight anyway, Steve. Yeah, yeah, the, the street fight's brutal. 
So I think when I was reading over the Observer, I think that he gave it like two and a quarter, or maybe even three and a three, quarter. Three and a quarter. Oh, yeah. Blew my fucking I mind. I he was on some good stuff that night. Yeah, he was smoking some good things Holy that night. That shit, Nelson. that was. There was no way. There's no way you can watch that. And yeah, that I shit remember. I just stars. Meltzer gave the Doomsday Cage match minus three stars. He gave that Chicago Street Fight three and a quarter. He's full of shit. He he, got bad yeah, I think he flip flopped. I think. Well, I wouldn't give the Doomsday Cage match either, but <laughs> he, de- he definitely did. You know, I think he forgot he, the minus maybe on that Street Fight. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe uh, <laughs> I would flip them to be honest with you. After you watch that street fight and then you go into the Doomsday, I know anything street stars. Show, so I don't, I don't <laughs> want to give you, give it away. But I thought it was decent to a degree. Like you can't I, go in there and expect I can't a five say that. classic. But I wasn't I felt expecting like they, much. <laughs> they did, they did what they could do in the shit situation that they were handed. <laughs> they were handed, or they created on their own. I don't know <laughs> who created it. <laughs> I'm sure Kevin Sullivan had a big hand in it. That's what I'm saying. So it wasn't like Hogan designed the cage and the idea behind it. He just added to it. Hey, we'll get eight guys in here instead of four. <laughs> so who knows? They, Meltzer was smoking crack. On oh, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, I, don't, I don't know what's going no on. What's stars. funny is, is I uh, right here, real quick results here for Uncensored 96, by the way. In the Observer, it received a 7% thumbs up. Right. 26 people gave it thumbs up. Those people were smoking crack. With Dave Meltzer as well. Although I got to be fair, the undercard was pretty solid, so maybe that's no. why they were giving it a thumbs up. Well, it was okay. <laughs> well, yeah, well, Bruiser and Regal. After Bruiser and Regal, I guess Parker and Medusa wasn't bad for what it was. I wasn't right, expecting anything, but right. Rob Parker did a great job selling there. So after match three, it falls apart. Right. We'll run over those results real quick. Main event matches, of course, these were live aired on the main event 605 program before the pay per view. JL over D Malenko, which was a shocker. Jim Duggan beats Big Bubba for the 92nd time in a row. Dick Slater beats Alex Wright, and the Steiners and Nasties go to a no contest when the Road Warriors interferes, attacks both teams. Then on the pay per view, it was U.S. champion Conan over Eddie Guerrero after an unintentional low blow, 18 minutes, 27 seconds. The Belfast Bruiser Finley over Steve Regal by DQ after the Blue Bloods interfere in 17 minutes. 33 seconds. That was a match where Regal actually broke his nose a hard way. Finley really busted his nose open. Regal actually required surgery from that. We saw Colonel Rob Parker over Medusa with help from Dick Slater. Three minutes, 47 seconds. The booty man replaces Johnny B. Bad in his feud with DDP because I guess you can just do that, Steve. Just replace somebody in the middle of a feud. I guess that's that's a thing. It's It's built an I quit match and where the winner has to quit professional wrestling. As DDP does the job, and he has to quit WCW, at least for the time being. And Brutus P.K. picked up the win there with 16, in 16 minutes. The Giant over Loch Ness with a Hulkster-style leg drop, brother, in two and a half minutes. Then it was on to the Chicago Street Fight. Sting and Booker T over the Road Raiders. Chris Booker T replaces Lex Luger because Jimmy Hart pulls Lex Luger out of the match because he has power of attorney. But even so, Sting and Booker over the roadies in 29 minutes. Who thought of this? In 33 seconds, Lex Luger actually winds up handcuffing Animal backstage, allowing Stevie Ray to run to ringside and nail Hawk with a chair. Booker T picks up the pin there, so Sting and Booker get the win. And then the infamous Doomsday Cage match goes 25 minutes and 16 seconds as Hogan Savage over Flair and Sullivan and Arn and Luger and Ming and the Barbarian and Zeus, the gangsta, and the ultimate solution, what a fucking match there. Savage pins Flair after Luger, quote-unquote, accidentally knocks out Ric Flair. Not so accidental there. Do they even follow up on that? Uh, they do in a promo coming up. Okay. Well, we'll <laughs> see here in a minute. It is time I don't know if for, we get a match. But... Mm, I think in a couple weeks we do, actually, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's WCW Monday Nitro for March 25th, 1996. We're in Huntsville, Alabama, a.k.a. Bobby Eaton Country, Steve, at the Von Braun Civic Center. 3300 paid. Pepe in a... Earl Robert Eaton. I apologize. Country. Well, when he's from Huntsville, Alabama, it's Bobby Eaton Country. They don't want to claim no Earl <laughs> Robert Eaton down there in Huntsville. I'll tell you, they don't even know what a fucking Earl is down there in Huntsville, Alabama. God bless him. <laughs> Way to, tr- way to trash our fans down in Huntsville. Not I know love, what an Earl is. I love Huntsville. They're good peeps. I, I kind of, I'm kind of bragging when I say that. <laughs> it's oh, okay. Well, you know better. You know better than I do. Pepe with Mongo out here. It's in a cow print cowboy hat this week, 
And what did you think of this opening match, Macho Man taking on the Belfast Bruiser? What an interesting match that could have been if they gave him something more than what they do. Not a bad match, but uh, what did you think of that when you when you saw these guys were going to work each other? Uh, I was excited for it. Yeah. Like we talked about last night, Nitro, Savage is the only dude selling, so you knew Belfast was going to look damn good here. And Finley beat the shit out of him. He laid in a really, really stiff European uppercut early on and macho sells it like he's like oh that one that one stung a little bit Mm -hmm. um (laughs) so savage is awesome i don't give a shit what anybody says i mean i know he's tied to hogan and he's kind of getting booed which is unfortunate but the dude's a pro Uh, i say it all the time he really is he doesn't care who he's in there with he's gonna sell he's gonna make him look good and then he has his offense like he he gave it back and um he he ate a lot of offense, but he gave it back and got the win. I thought it was a really, really solid TV match, and I, I wish it would have went 10 minutes instead of five. Yeah, I wish they'd give these guys more time here as well. Macho Man taking on Finley to kick off the show. Macho Man out in an awesome green looking. I don't care what anybody else oh, says. Man. I love this. That's like, true. if I could have owned one fucking Macho Man jacket, this random green jacket I've never seen him in before, this would have been the one. I mean, I love his night at WrestleMania 6 costume. I'll do that, too. But this here, this was a pretty damn badass, shiny green looking oh, jacket. Man. They need to make an action figure of this <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> I'm telling you, maybe he didn't yeah. honor Finley in Ireland. I don't really know what was going on here, but it looked badass. He never wore it before or again that I know of. I just I thought it I don't damn, know either. Damn cool. It's like a forest dark green that popped, and then the all white. I never seen him wear like that much white, so the green just popped off of it, and it was yeah, it looked, uh, looked really cool. Very different than everything else he's been wearing in WCW lately. Anyway. I'm just glad many. it wasn't red and yellow, you know? Yeah, I <laughs> hate that. I, I hated that. It kind of made me hate him <laughs> during that entire run when he was wearing that red and yellow shit, whatever the hell it looked like. Uh, somebody threw up red and yellow all over him. But the, as the match gets going, Finley is, uh, they note that Finley is still undefeated in WCW as he controls early on. Macho Man comes back with the, his arm is still taped up, but he looks very solid. So he's still taking care of that arm, Steve, but he's not really showing the signs of it in the ring anywhere at, the, at this point anyway. As he takes the fight to the floor, but the Savage winds up getting posted. Finley then lays it in, but misses a charge in the corner. And the Macho Man delivers the flying elbow, picks up the win in five minutes and four seconds. I wrote, solid TV match. Would have liked a better lead in to the finish. I thought the finish was kind of flat. Finley just kind of charged in the corner. Savage moved, and Finley took a back bump and just laid there dead. For Savage to look at him, go up top, drop the elbow. Just felt like it took a little long. They could have done something more special for the finish. But I agree with you. I wish it could have went a little longer, been a little more meaningful. Yeah, and also kind of feels like the way they did it, like he took himself out by posting himself. So they kind of protected him a little bit. Even though he took the elbow and got pinned clean, he still kind of took himself out. So if Savage would have just dominated the finish, slammed him, and then did the elbow, he would have looked weak. But he actually looked pretty strong coming out of that. He's still protected because he has that feud with Regal that gets good going forward. Yeah, I think he's here for another month or so, and then we don't see him for quite a while. But I I, I thought it was great when I saw these two were going to go out. I was like, wow, I don't remember this happening. So I was really pumped for it. As we see a clip of the old WCW 900 hotline. And creepy Gene Okerlund getting scooped, sneaking around, hiding under tables, behind doors, and things of that nature. And we get a glimpse of Sting and Johnny B. Bad, who I believe that B stands for blank now, as he's a big blank, black, blank (laughs) over his face to hide who he is now that he's part of the World Wrestling Federation. Why not just get rid of the commercial? Why not add filler, like in there, just add a completely different uh, segment part of that commercial? Why not omit that part of the commercial, it just looks so tacky here. Johnny, you have with the big black rectangular uh, <laughs> gimmick you, over you, his face here. <laughs> you said it yourself. Tony has mentioned it. Once it was in the can, it stays in the can. <laughs> and he wasn't fixing nothing. Well, I guess they had to to put the blank spot on his head. So, yeah. Yeah, I think Tony, but Tony used to usually, usually reference that from like the old days, not this Bischoff era. But yeah, no, I agree uh, with you. I, I get I get what you're saying. It, it's, it's about the same. <laughs> it's yes, about the same. Yeah. <laughs> Mean Gene Okerlund in the or in a promo here with Ric Flair, woman, and Miss Elizabeth. Flair says he's got the whole world in his hands. Bray Wyatt's stealing some things there. The Macho Man's woman in one hand, and he has 
Woman, oh woman, won't you marry me now? In his other hand, Ric Flair has it all. And tonight, he slays a real-life breathing giant. The pervert Gene Oakland is caught looking at woman during the promo legitimately. Flair calls him out to have a little fun with him. So a woman begins to play with Gene, touching him on his chin. She better be careful there. Never know what's going to pop up. Who is better, says Ric Flair, himself or Lex Luger? Which kind of comes out of nowhere. I thought it did anyway, because he's not working Luger tonight, mind you. And of course, the ladies say Ric Flair is. Flair then mocks Macho Man because Elizabeth has all of his money, which is kind of a big story here. Even though Elizabeth's been back for weeks, they start all of a sudden out of nowhere, at least uh, to me anyway, really dwelling on this whole thing about Elizabeth having all Savage's money here this week on Nitro. Yeah, and I know Bischoff types, hypes it up by saying that he wants, she wants not only half of what they had when they were married, but he wants, she wants half of everything that he makes going forward too. So she's definitely taking him for everything he has. And, and knowing Macho Man like we do now, like he, she took a lot because that dude didn't spend shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure she uh, she did pincher. well for herself. I think, <laughs> I think Lanny said he went to the he tried to talk Macho into spending his money. He's like, you're gonna die and go to the grave with like 15 million or 20 million in your bank account or whatever it was, some ridiculous number that he had saved from all those years of wrestling, Hollywood, and everything that he was doing. So the complete polar opposite of Ric Flair. Yes, Ric Flair is spending 50, making 20. Yes, Savage is saving every damn penny that he can. So, <laughs> um. <laughs> and and giving it away, giving it away to to ladies, apparently. I guess. Well, I think he's only married to Liz, and then obviously the lady he married, his right. high school sweetheart or whatever, right, when he right. died. So she did get it all, I guess. I think George George took a few bucks just for the hell of it somewhere somehow. I feel like I feel uh, like that. <laughs> I'm sure she did. Back to the ring, United States Champion Conan taking on Mister J. Well, he's not Mister anymore. It's just JL. So. Jerry Lynn no longer gender identified as Mr. I suppose here, Steve. He's just JL. Really good stuff from both Lucha arm drags, head scissors, fast paced match. Conan with a one arm monkey flip, but JL lands on his feet. But they're too busy selling the Macho Man Ric Flair feud on commentary to point any of this stuff out. So now we don't have so much Hulk Hogan on the screen at this point in time, but they're still using it to sell other top stars instead of what we're seeing in the ring. Conan nails a senton for a two count. JL comes back, nails a nice looking spinning elbow, but sells it himself as if he knocked heads with Conan. I'm not really sure what happened here. JL then goes to the top rope with a drop kick. Did you see this, Steve? Drop kick mm-hmm. into the side of Conan's head. I'm not joking. This was a shoot drop kick into the side of Conan's head. Conan didn't look happy. And the way he took the bump, he even sells his knee as well. The announcers and even me kind of feared like, Did he blow out his knee? Because sometimes, you know, like look at Dr. Death during that brawl for all you get knocked silly. You take a funny fall. You can take your knee out as well. And Conan, I I thought maybe he got injured there for a second. I wrote yikes, but Conan back up. He makes JL pay. You can tell this is a shoot. He didn't call it. He didn't prep Jerry Lynn for it. He just grabbed him and drove him down into a gut wrench power bomb out of nowhere. Uh, Excellent cradles back and forth from there as the match continues on. The crowd, I wrote, is dead, I noticed, as I was really enjoying the match, and they were doing these back-and-forth cradles, and I noticed there's no crowd reaction at all. Not a good crowd for wrestling. Maybe maybe for the bigger name stars, but not wrestling here in Alabama. So they're not really accustomed to big-time moves here. It's the South. They just like the big names and the heel heat and the top baby faces, and that's what they're looking for, not so much the flashy stuff down here. Conan goes to the middle rope, but JL grabs him and drives him off the middle rope into a DDT. Nasty for a near fall as Nick Patrick was slow to make the cover. Even the announcers had to cover for Nick Patrick. Even Bobby Heenan had to cover for Nick Patrick. Oh, I think he was looking to see if uh, Conan's leg was on the rope. Uh, No, it was just Nick Patrick. I think he was waiting for something to happen that didn't happen. As the match continues on, JL tries an up and over in the corner, but Conan catches his legs. Spins around and nails a spike power bomb, gets the win in six minutes and eighteen seconds. And Conan, I wrote as he wins, he just looks like a grumpy, grumpy man. I wrote he has the face of a heel, but he's a baby face here still. At least in the early part of nineteen ninety six. Bischoff then sells the cruiserweight title tournament 
Who will be advancing? Even announces some of the guys that have been advancing in the tournament, Steve. The problem is the tournament ended five days ago, which Bischoff does not acknowledge. Of course, isn't it taped? So right. you can only really call what's been aired. It's in new, It's uh, in Japan. I mean, the, the tournament's in Japan. Yeah. Uh, didn't he say JL was uh, like beat D. Malenko to advance in the tournament? That's what they said. I think they were going off that match at main event on the uncensored pay-per-view, even though the yeah. tournament had already been yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But um, a Bishop yeah, doesn't th- know. This is a... <laughs> Yeah, he definitely doesn't. Um, <laughs> this match was okay. It, I liked it, but it's just it's typical WCW bullshit where they're just talking about Macho Man. He's in the back tearing down doors, trying yes. to get to Ric Flair, and it's, they're going ballistic. And he needs like get a camera back there. Why why don't we have a camera going on? Um, and it's just when you don't when your commentary is not even paying attention to what's going on in the ring. When you're missing big spots, I think they he did that drop kick in the middle while they were going on. Oh, and that on was about it. That, yeah, and they didn't even talk about it. So it just you can see it and you get it, but at the same time, you need the announcers to put the shit over as it's happening. And when half the match is just ignored because of nothing that's going on in the back, they're just trying to make it look like there's something going on in the back. It, it's unfortunate for these guys. I know this changes when they start adding, you know, like Mike Tanay and things like that to really talk about the matches and get them over and talk about the moves and, you know, educate us on what we're watching. It's great, but right now they can care less. I thought this was a really, really good TV match. I was really impressed, really surprised by how Conan kept up with the speedy style of Jerry Lynn during the match and some of the stuff that was going on here, some of the lucha drags and stuff, very impressive stuff from both guys. And, uh, you know, I I feel like Conan's really out of his element sometimes with some of these guys. I get it. He's from Mexico. He knows a lot of these moves, but that doesn't mean his body is necessarily built for a lot of these moves. But I thought he did a really good job here with Jerry Lynn, really good job. And I was really disappointed. Not only the crowd was dead, that didn't help. But yeah, the announcers, the entire time were, we're make believe storytelling for Randy Savage in the back, and it just really ruined the whole thing. It was just, this match was an afterthought before it even got started. Typical, right? Typical WCW. Typical Eric Bischoff on commentary too yes. here in '96. As we get going, uh, we continue on with the <clears throat> Battle of the Awesome theme music's right. The Disco Inferno taking on Big Brother Booty, the Booty Man here. Booty Man forced DDP into retirement last night. Booty is so dangerous he. Lived like a rat in the Dungeon of Doom for a year, they say, all for Hulk Hogan. What things he'll do for his buddy Hulk Hogan, and now he gets a push because of it. Eric Bischoff has no idea who his talent even is, referring to Disco Inferno the entire match as Disco Fever. And finally, here comes Kimberly out, even though I think she's already with Booty Man at this point, but apparently not. She's now called the Booty Babe, though she didn't accompany him to the ringside. She actually comes to ringside, Beefcake sticks his ass through the ropes, and she spanks it, Steve. And that revs him up for the finish as he runs back over and nails Disco Inferno with a high knee, or the high knee, in a minute and 15 seconds and gets the win. What a terrible, terrible match. Just making sure Ed Leslie makes it to Nitro, though. And he even gets to kiss Kimberly on the way out of the ring. Lucky him, I guess. I think uh, there's, uh, I can't even remember what I was going to say about this. Uh, I think, yeah, Eric Bischoff, he's like, where's the booty babe at? Where is she at tonight? Like, kind of spoiling it that she ain't out there yet. And uh, I, typical stuff there. But I don't know why she's just not coming to the ring. She has the get up. She's wearing all the shit. Why did she come down like halfway through? Have, yeah. That, it, it was only a minute long match. So it, it it's even boggles it, my it mind. It makes even no more. sense. Yeah. It makes no sense. Pay per view, it made sense. It hadn't necessarily been done just yet that they got together. But she came down all dressed up to kind of show her affection for the booty man. Mm-hmm. Um, so after the pay-per-view is over, she should just be accompanying him to ringside. Why are we waiting to get him out there, to get her out there? Yeah, it, it confused me too. And then the whole uh, spanking his ass to you know hulk him up. Uh, I don't know. It was whatever you want to call it. it was Stupid. Awful. Stupid. This yeah. week on WCW Saturday Night, Lex Luger defends the TV title against Shark. It's Sting taking on Dean Malenko. Ric Flair in singles action. Earl Robert Eaton up against Fit Finley, Belfast Bruiser. And the Giant meets Big Bubba Rogers. That should be fun. And we I noted here that 
Eric Bischoff is a dick because as he mentions the announcers for Saturday night, Dusty Rhodes and Tony Schiavone, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, he gives away Tony's real name. He's like, his name is Noah. Did you know of that? And they, oh, I did know of that. That's right. Tony Schiavone's real name is Noah. Like, why are you giving away people's real? This is W. This is wrestling. If you have a work name, that's your work name. At no point does Hulk Hogan come down and Eric Bischoff go, you know, his name's Terry. Did you know his name's Randall Poffo? I mean, so I just, I thought it was kind of shitty. Just Eric Bischoff for no reason. I don't know. I, I, it got to me. I'm like, why? Like, what was the point of that? Yeah. Who knows? Bischoff being Bischoff, I guess. So he, we just, he's not like a wrestling guy, you know, right. he was never really a wrestling guy. So he never really did any of that, that stuff really. By this so, point, he has to have some sort of a clue. Well, yeah, I get that. But I just, it, it, to me, like, it just feels like if you're not in it for the right reasons. Right. And like, it's just a job to him, maybe, uh, to whereas other people, it's a little bit more serious. It's a livelihood. Uh, there's, there's a code of honor, so to speak. It's kind of like the mafia a little bit, no honor among thieves. But my point is, is kayfabe and stuff like that meant a lot to a lot of people and for people to come in who may not have the, a, a clear understanding of what exactly that means. Um, they're not going to give a shit. It was so out of nowhere. You're like, why? What yeah, the hell is this? Yeah. Like, you know, like Tony Giovanni has been around since 1983. Nobody's decided. Has Dusty <laughs> done it though before? I could have sworn I've heard Dusty say that or make fun of him a little bit on some of those early pay-per-views or, uh, you know what? I don't uh, question anything. Dusty does. That's, I think that I, I'm not going to give him a pass, but at the same time, Dusty just does what Dusty does. I, I don't know what the hell Dusty does sometimes. I don't care if Dusty does it, <laughs> but when some dick like Bischoff does yeah. it, it's like it, it just comes across as a dick move, whereas right, yep. Dusty's just being funny. Yeah. Or and, You know what? You know who did it? My bad. It was Jesse. Jesse always called him Noah. Really? Oh, you mean in WCW? In okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. 93, All like right. those Saturday nights and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I know he didn't do that in WWF, but I got you now. No, no, absolutely not. Vince wouldn't allow that shit. That shit don't buy here, pal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you go watch those Saturday nights in 93, he does it a lot. He calls him Noah. Up to Noah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I haven't watched those in a very long time, so that may be why I don't remember that. Uh, love, it's, it, Jesse, it is excellent theme music night tonight, Steve. We just heard the Disco and uh, Inferno's theme. We heard Big Brother Booty's theme. Now it's the American Males out to the ring, taking on Tag Team Champion Sting and the Total Package Lex Luger. Bagwell has a movie opportunity coming up, according to Eric Bischoff. He may transition to the silver screen. Well, we both know that doesn't happen. Scotty Riggs starts off the match with some nice drop kicks on Luger early on. Lex actually knocks Bagwell off the apron, but then Bagwell kind of gets pissy and yanks Lex Luger out of the ring. They start to go out onto the floor when Lex tries to nail Bagwell into the guardrail. Sting grabs his own partner, Luger, and pulls him away. He tries to talk sense to him. What are you doing? These are our friends, Lex. As the match goes on, Sting and Bagwell uh, take turns in the ring. Sting comes out on top, on top of Bagwell. The American Males finally do get some heat on Lex Luger until Bagwell misses a reverse body block on Lex, and Lex goes all stone cold on Bagwell, just beats the living shit out of him out of the middle of nowhere. Forearms and knee drops and punches and just went crazy for about a matter of about 15, 20 seconds. It was pretty cool as Bagwell does make a comeback. Nails a flying forearm to Lex Luger, gets the hot tag out to Scotty Riggs. Sting also tags in as well. We end up with the old four-way melee. Sting finally nails a cross body block on Riggs as Bagwell comes in to stop it, then stops short and just kind of watches Sting gets the win. And he just kind of shrugs like, ah, shit. And the tag team champions win in about six and a half minutes. What did you think of the finish? I know they tried to sell it like, Bagwell's a baby face. He didn't want to break up the pin. He was trying to be honorable. It stings his buddy, but this is for the tag team titles. And even if it's not, you're trying to win this match. I've seen you stop pinfall counts before. I don't know. Was Bagwell not supposed to be there that close to the, the pinfall? I don't know really what happened here. They tried to sell it like he was being honorable. I just thought it came off really shitty as Bagwell's like four feet from the, the cover yeah. and just kind of watches it and goes, Damn. Yeah, I, I hate that finish uh, when the tag partner is not being stopped and he's just standing there and he doesn't get in. Like, we've seen you get in six times with no problem. Now, all of a sudden, it's a problem to get in. 
And the fact that he had like one leg in the ring and stuff. Yeah, he was already well. halfway in the ring, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that it just made it feel very, very flat and almost like he missed his timing or something. It, something was wrong was somewhere. Either Lex wasn't like there to stop him, or and you know I don't think that was the case. He wasn't looking for Lex, like, "Hey, where are you? Grab my leg" or anything. He was yeah. just kind of like, "Shit, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should have been on the floor." And he just yeah. kind of yeah, it was it and, was definitely uh, flat. I think too, also like. Right afterwards, when he gets in the ring, he he looked frustrated with Riggs, and I know, I it looked like that. And Sting turned around and kind of got them all together, and they celebrate and do all that. So it was very very subtle, uh, where he just kind of slapped his knees and was like, "Damn it!" And I don't know, that could have been frustration from being in the wrong spot to make it look like shit, or just taking the loss, or just mad at Riggs, whatever the case may be. But um, it's very it was a solid match. It, it was great storytelling, I thought. Uh, you know, Luger and Bagwell get in there. They hate each other, beating the shit out of each other. And Sting comes in, and it's just more your traditional wrestling match. And so they did a really good job of that. But the finish just felt very, very flat. Kind of took away from the whole thing. Yeah, Sting was trying to play it up like they were his buddies. He was being friends with them. He was having a competitive competition with them. But fair. And Luger was just being, you know, the bad guy, the heel. I don't really yeah. care. I'm just trying to win this match. And, you know, like I said, he went all stone cold on Bagwell. And. Not just yeah. that, just, uh, you know, all throughout the match, it was kind of that way, in- including the after the match, when Sting's in the ring, he kind of celebrates, if you want to call it that, with the males, even though they lost, they're kind of like, yay, Sting. Meanwhile, Luger's leaving down the aisle. He wants nothing to <laughs> do with any of this as we go into commercial break. We come back. I will say, too, yeah, uh, go ahead. real quick, uh, yeah. the commentary, I think it was Heenan, and it's back to Heenan. Being it's, the always pro. Heenan. it's always Heenan. It's always Heenan. But uh, he was talking about how, Sting kind of trained Bagwell when he came into WCW and how they were really good friends and been friends for a long time um, ever since Bagwell came in. So they played that up, and that, and that that's what I was kind of talking about. They had the commentary, Heenan in particular, really drove it home what you was seeing in the ring. So right. when they're paying attention to the matches and actually selling it and getting the shit over, it works. Shocker. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll see You know if they can capitalize on such things. I'm going to go with uh, no. No, they never do. <laughs> we move on with WCW champion Ric Flair coming to the ring by woman and Miss Elizabeth taking on the giant. It's technically heel versus heel here. As Flair makes his way down, Elizabeth has Macho Man's money in her hands. She's starting to throw it out to the crowd, handing some to woman. She's handing it out as, as well. Shortly behind them is the Macho Man who has clearly gotten pissy backstage. He tries to attack. I don't know if he's trying to attack Elizabeth. I'm sure he's done that in the past. But he's trying to get his hands on Ric Flair for certain as the ladies are handing out the money. But it's Jim Nuggan and Eddie Guerrero and I don't even know who else trying to hold Savage back, keep him from getting at Flair in the aisle way. And woman kind of walks back up to Randy Savage and slaps him across the face. Takes a little advantage there, uh, Doug, or excuse me, Savage being held back. And I wrote, where is Jimmy Hart? He's nowhere to be seen here in the corner of the giant. He's also been attending Ric Flair matches. He's nowhere around ringside for this match, at least to get going. Ric Flair gets in the face of the giant and just pie-faced, shoves him down, the giant does. Flair takes some fun bumps off tackles and other things really early on. Giant with a giant press slam on Ric Flair. It was so good that you can actually visibly, they're right in the camera, Steve. Ric Flair is sitting there right in the camera, and he tells Randy Anderson to tell the giant to do it again. And you watch the giant, or Randy Anderson, run over the giant and say something. And then guess what? The Giant does it again. A second press slam to the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Very, very easy to spot if you know what you're looking for here. Uh, Flair tries to leave. He actually goes up the aisle, but the Giant grabs him, carries him back to ringside. Giant then nose sells some shots, some chops. Suplex on the Nature Boy as Flair does the flip into the corner. Comes off the top rope, but he's caught by the Giant and dropped down into a backbreaker. Bischoff then announces Hog Wild in the middle of all this shit. I wrote, ugh, just thinking about that already. He's announcing this way back here so many months earlier. So it was certainly in the plans early on in 1996. Anyways, back to the match. Giant off the top rope, but misses a splash by 90 yards at least. Even if Flair hadn't moved. Did you see that? They tried to sell like, oh, if Ric Flair hadn't gone out of the way, he would have been smashed into the canvas. No, he wouldn't have because the Giant flew across the ring to the other side. Whether Flair had moved or not, he would have never have touched him. I thought it was fun. Though. It's crazy to see what the Giant can do off the top rope, although we wouldn't see it much longer. Yeah, the Giant, uh, Flair was like in position to take a Vader bomb 
Right. <laughs> and the giant Very close to the corner. On the other side of the ring by the uh, <laughs> by the other turnbuckle. Uh, so yeah, it, it didn't matter if Flair rolled out of the way or not. Giant wasn't hitting him. Yeah. Uh, the Giant then misses a charge into the corner on Ric Flair, and Flair takes advantage, chokes the Giant with what Bobby Eaton calls piano wire for uh, the first real offense of the entire match by the champion. He even goes to the eyes of the Giant and gets in a uh, low blow kick right to the groin behind the referee's back. Woman then takes advantage, choking the Giant with the same wire. Flair then caught off the top rope, though the Giant's not going to sell for long. Press slams Flair from the top. Giant calls for the choke slam as Flair flops around. Beautiful selling by the Nature Boy. Instead of getting out of the way or trying to commit some offense or rolling out of the ring, Flair just looks at the Giant. And the Giant's Rah! with his hand in the air. Flair starts taking back bumps and rolling around and pleading and God no and really good selling by, by Ric Flair here. As yes, he does wind up taking the choke slam, but it's Miss Elizabeth in the ring to distract Randy Anderson from the pinfall. Woman enters the ring with Elizabeth to distract while Arn Anderson comes to the ringside. Then Arn with a nasty chair shot across the back of the Giant. But as the Giant turns around, Kevin Sullivan's out to take the chair from Arn Anderson. So what does the Giant see? He sees his own friend Kevin Sullivan standing there with the chair. His own friend hit him? The Giant thinks so. Kevin Sullivan says, no, 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 brada. And he drops the chair, but the Giant's not buying it. Choke slam to Kevin Sullivan. It's Arn Anderson stands there laughing, so it's choke slam to Arn Anderson as the bell finally sounds in eight minutes and fifty five seconds, and the ladies and Jimmy Hart tend to their fallen prey, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Kevin Sullivan, as if they are dead. Everyone's murdered in the ring from these choke slams, and the giant leaves pissed. The announcement is a no contest. I had wondered why the giant was working Flair and Big Bubba this week, but. I thought it made more sense now. It kind of looked like a, a baby face turn, at least for the time being. What a solid night overall, I thought, besides the Booty Man match, which only went a minute. Yeah, it wasn't a bad show. I, I hated the finish here, and it kind of ruined uh, it for me. It's just typical finish, cluster, 20 different people interfering and all the same stupid shit. To be honest, like I would rather just see somebody get DQ'd with like a low blow. You know, Flair gets frustrated. He ain't gonna be able to do nothing with the giant. The ref's right there. Let's just low blow him and then do the angles afterwards. I mean, just get a finish to the match and don't ruin or end the match like that. The angles sometimes just happen a little too early for me. And this one, the match was good. Flair did great. Um, giant did good for the stuff that he was doing. I was I was curious how they get out of this one, and it's typical, so uh, like my note here said, what a shit ending to a decent main event. Yeah, I didn't really care so much, obviously, for the ending. I didn't think we would get a pinfall unless the Giant was taking the bell here, which I didn't re remember him doing. So that wasn't too much of a shocker that we didn't get a pinfall here. I'm not really against the finish. I mean, I don't care for it, but I've seen yeah. worse here lately anyway. I've seen Hogan booting and leg dropping people out of nowhere. So, I mean, it is what it is. I, just... I love the turn. I'll tell you that. Uh, the problem yeah, yeah, is what, what happens that, that, next the week. It was great. The yeah. angle was great. And, right. Um, I, I can't remember how far back it goes. I think it was, I, I can't remember the match. I know it happened, but somebody came down and ended it. It was Macho Man's match when he was the champion. I think Luger came down, if I remember right. It was a few weeks ago. It was a, probably maybe a month ago where Macho couldn't even get the win against like a, a known, like I, it may have been Arn Anderson or, or somebody lower in the Dungeon of Doom. Like he couldn't even beat him. Like he couldn't even get the elbow and win and then do the angle. Like they did the angle to get a DQ win for him. And it's just none of these champions have gotten definitive wins in close to six to eight months, it feels like. Like yeah, the only I definitive think, wins are the title changes, not anything afterwards. Right. I think my biggest issue, not just with the – the title matches, but a lot of these main event matches anyway, these overbooked uh, nonsensical finishes is that we really, how many times have I asked you now what the finish was? What do you think? Why are we speculating what the finish of a match is? When did that become a thing in professional, right? Usually you watch a wrestling yeah. match, you know what the finish is. Yeah. And I don't know how many times now on Nitro we pondered, was this a count out? Was it a no contest? Was it a disqualification? 
did he win? What the hell just happened here? We don't know. Yeah. We see D- Dave Meltzer say one thing. We say the result books say another thing. Nobody really fucking truly knows what some of this shit is. And here, the only reason I know this is a no contest, thank God, during the closing of the show, we, yeah, we can hear in the background the announcer announcing, this match is a no contest. It's the only reason I fucking yeah. know this is a no contest. Yeah, I heard Pinzer say, and then um, Bischoff on commentary, they said it was out of control. Yeah. I, I, that that might have been Pin, Pinzer who said it. They determined that this match is out of control, and it's a no contest. Like, yeah. Since when has that ever been a reason for a no contest? It's just out of control. Sorry, guys. We don't know who the hell's cheating or doing what, so we can't call DQ on anybody. Just garbage, man. It's... It's they want something, they want to book it a certain way, but then they don't want to give you, they don't want to, they don't want to go 100% all in on it. It's like, okay, this sounds like a great idea, but how do we get out of it? Let's put Flair and Giant in a match together, but that'd be great. That, that'd pop a rating, but how do we get out of it? Because we really can't have Flair lose. We're not ready for the turn just yet. We got to do subtle things. Just go out there and do it, have like 20 people mess around and then just wait for the bell to ring. Like, yeah, it, it's I thought it was shitty I, and lazy. I thought it was, uh, you know, like you said, the, the finish was shit. I thought the actual turn was awesome. Unfortunately, they ruined yeah. that by, by next week. So I'm well, sure that had, Ho- I'm sure Hogan <laughs> had something typical. to do. I'm sure Hogan had something to do with that. Anyway, segment of the night. Was it Flair and the Giant? Was it the tag team title match? Conan versus Jerry Lynn? Was it Booty getting his ass smacked or the Macho Man taking on Finley? I'm sure somebody enjoyed Booty getting his ass smacked. Mm-hmm. I don't know who, but um, I went with Macho and Fl- uh, Bruiser. Um, oh, wow. Okay. It was a pretty fun match. And, and like I said earlier, Savage did an excellent job of selling and made him believable. You could see, uh, like we mentioned, Dusty said he's a, he could be a main eventer. You can see that. Uh, he's very believable. It doesn't matter. Like I know because it's older and I'm watching like Revisionist. But I believed Finley in the ring with Macho Man. The dude's a badass, and yeah. especially here. And um, he doesn't have the look. But after you break some dude's nose the night before, uh, you're going to be taken a little serious. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I I like the match. I, I thought the show was solid for the most part. And then the finish of the main event, and this, it just really leaves a terrible taste in your mouth. And my biggest issue, like I stated, was World champions just don't get wins. I, I, I don't think I've seen any WCW champion since we started this get a win of any kind that was clean. And uh, I, I just feel like it totally devalues your title. It makes it useless because your champions can't get wins, and the only way they can get out of these title matches is by cheating. So what mm-hmm. the hell does that say about your champions? They're all right. pussies yeah, or shitty booking. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I just feel like I'm not saying the Giants should have lost here clean. Uh, no way. But I think you need to stop booking these matches where you're stuck trying to keep a guy over and then having your world champion in competitive matches. I got him guys that can force yeah. some losses and build up your champion. It's not hard. Yeah. No, I agree. There's a lot of uh, non finish finishes in the world title matches. That's for sure. I got to tell you, man, when this when this episode finished, I was really, really pleasantly surprised, really happy. I was like, wow, that was outside of that one minute, and 15 seconds of Brutus Beefcake. That was probably the most overall enjoyable Nitro, just random matches on the show, top to bottom, not a whole lot of Hulk Hogan bullshit in between. I mean, Conan and Jerry Lynn was solid, you know, based on a wrestling match. Macho and Finley was a very solid match. I like Flair. I thought Flair did an excellent job with the Giant. I thought Giant did a great job, but I thought Flair's selling, not just bumping, just his selling, his mannerisms, his silliness in between was really great. The finish sucked. Sting and Luger against the Males was perfectly fine as well. I was just really happy with the entire show overall. Like It didn't feel like some super power, a star-studded Nitro, but it just felt like a really good TV show, top to bottom. So my segment for the night has to be Man, I almost want to go Flair and Giant if I can just ignore the finish because I love <laughs> I love the interaction between the two and I love the post match turn. If I can just pretend like the finish didn't exist, I think I think that's what I'm going to have to do here. I think that's what I'm going with. Although I didn't, I mean, I like I said, I enjoyed everything on this show besides the Booty Man and the Disco Inferno. Makes sense. And we move on to WWF Monday Night Raw for March 25th, taped back on March 11th at Freeman Coliseum, San Antonio, Texas. This is the go-home show to WrestleMania 12. 
In the ring, it's Shawn Michaels taking on Al Snow, now known as Leaf Cassidy. Combination of Leaf Garrett and David Cassidy, 70s teen heartthrobs, if you will. He's a goofball now, Steve. I don't know how well you, you receive that. I, I hated this gimmick, but it is what it is. Sean debuts the click camera entrance, heads to the ring with a handheld camera in his hand, and it becomes part of the entrance camera as well. So they kind of flash between the real WWF camera and Sean's camera on his way to the ring. Introduces Jose Lothario, who will now not only be his manager, but he will be at ringside for WrestleMania. Then it's Bret Hart to ringside immediately for commentary. As Jerry Lawler just happens to leave, he says he left the lights on in his car. He has to go turn them off for his battery dies. Convenient for the king. Is Bret Hart on commentary for this Shawn Michaels match? Fast start. Great bumps by Al Snow early on. Snow even lands a sit-out spine buster. And then a spinning Uranagi to Shawn Michaels as well. Marty Jannetty then makes his way to ringside to root on Leaf Cassidy. Cassidy gets some heat on HBK, tries a, a powerbomb pickup into a hot shot, but Sean's legs actually catch the top rope, and that could have been dangerously or dangerous going into the pay-per-view, Steve. Could have been bye-bye for Shawn Michaels here if, uh, if they had taken the bump. In, in, yeah. In the, yeah, it was not pretty. No, I, my, I put my note down here. There was lots of close calls, like the, the spine buster. Mm -hmm. He bumped his head there, too. Like There's a lot of close calls here. Uh, Sean could have got really hurt. There was they looked bad, and uh, it's not like your typical botches where one dude's maybe slipping, and you know he gets back up on the ropes and things like that. Now he he basically hit his legs on the top rope, landing on his neck, coming down, and uh, it was very very sloppy. And yeah, um, I I gotta say as much as I loved Al Snow and Smoky Mountain and, and what a quality star he is, we've seen him slip up as Avatar, we've seen him slip up as Shinobi. Now he's in here with the the money man, Shawn Michaels, the guy that's going to cash. Cow. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And he's in here damn near breaking Shawn's neck two or three times. It's it's mm -hmm. pretty dangerous. Uh, Al, I wouldn't call Al sloppy. It's just he has that indie mentality, oh. and uh, everything's just very different here. Got to slow things down. I'm sure he finally catches on because we don't see these things moving forward so much with, with Al Snow. But, yeah, it was – very dangerous at times, and kudos to Shawn Michaels for not blowing a gasket, breaking kayfabe, throwing a fit, stiffing him, yelling at him, cussing him out. He just kind of went with the flow here. Al Snow with a superplex. Cassidy then tries it again, but Shawn reverses it and drops Cassidy face first onto the mat. Shawn then with a top rope clothesline, the kip up, and it's the big HBK comeback as Shawn comes off the ropes with a flying forearm, but Marty Jannetty trips HBK up and yanks Shawn into the corner. That pisses the hitman off on the headset. He jumps off commentary and shoves Marty Jannetty out of the way. As Cassidy charges into the corner, Shawn Michaels steps aside. Cassidy then turns around into a super kick. Shawn Michaels picks up the win in about ten and a half minutes. Post-match, Shawn Michaels out of the ring as Bret Hart's arguing with Marty Jannetty. Shawn gets in between the two and starts shoving Bret Hart. It's a confrontation between Shawn and Bret as they both kind of Really wanted to go after Marty, but they wind up going after one another, at least verbally. Brett then pushes Sean aside, and they argue, and they get nose-to-nose -nose as Jose Lothario tries to get in between them, tries to pull Sean away. Uh, how did you feel about the match, and how did you feel about the final Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels showdown here, if you will? Um, the match was okay. Like, like I said, it was good. It's just those spots were scary. I mean, you're a week away <laughs> from Mania, and... Uh... I bet Vince was like sitting ringside. Like, oh shit! Oh shit! I can't believe Al still had a job a week after uh, this. Just, get, just come on, man. We got ten minutes. Just please don't get hurt, because <laughs> you you just these clips were rough. Uh, these these misses were pretty bad. Brett on commentary was pretty funny. I thought. I mean, it's not. He wasn't intended to be funny. No. But he's he's like uh, he called like I said earlier. I kind of jumped ahead of myself he called the attackers and syracuse cheerleaders he said there aren't nine guys in syracuse that could do that to him and my note here is the best part about all of this and it, this is what makes it great to me he believes the shit he's saying oh yeah whether it's true or not doesn't matter he believes it and that's funny to me um you know Meltzer I, referred to I, a lot I of love. these comments not just here this week but in recent weeks brett's subtle heel commentary subtle heel interviews 
there's nothing subtle or heel about it. This is just Bret Hart is what this is. Yeah, he did the same thing to Lex Luger, and I'm sure Meltzer never said anything about that either. I love him because that's who I grew up with, and I. But I've never, I've never seen anyone like him in real life, <laughs> and just in general as a person. He's he's fascinating to me as like a you know you look at it like a from a psycho, like a psychological uh, review like how do you get this way <laughs> like you mentioned earlier Diesel said he's not all there you just accept him for who he is or or whatever it is and yeah there's been shoots where Brad. people are like hey Bret Hart said this about you Kevin Nash. you know they want a response and they're like yeah what do you what do you got to say about that? Nash just kind of lets it go, you know. And it's not nice things, mind you. It's not like no, Bret Hart no. said you're not a great wrestler. It's like Bret Hart says you're a fuck bag, you know. And Diesel or Nash is just kind of like, dude, the guy grew up in a house that that they they called the room the dungeon. He's like, I, yeah. I know I've heard stories of what Bret went through. The cat's not all there. He didn't even doesn't even say it like that. I mean, he's more polite than that. Right. He's just yeah. like, I yeah, just I, I let it go. I let him say whatever he's gonna say. I I ain't gonna say shit back. I think a lot of a lot of people are like that. I don't. You don't really hear people come out and trash him unless there is people that never really liked him to begin with. Yeah, I think they just accept him for who he is, and you just got to move on. But and then he made another one too. Like this is when he was getting good, legit at the very end, right when he got off commentary. He, like his last line was, "Brett's getting tired of the excuses of Sean and says everything is taking a toll on Shawn Michaels, like in a condescending tone." Because right. he or last week in his vignette, he was talking about how he's been getting his ass kicked by seven footers and going through these brawls with guys, going through tables and things like that. And nobody's making excuses for him. I mean, nobody says anything about him. Hell, he was yeah. in a cage match with Diesel. So if Sean gets beat up by some guys in Syracuse and bumps his head from Owen, and it's like, oh, he's taking a toll. Like, everything's taking a toll. Even though he's been booked like Hulk Hogan light. Like, look at him at the Royal Rumble. We talked about it on on the grenade uh, for yeah. Royal Rumble. He's press slamming Kid out of the ring and dumping Vader and Yoko. He's not yeah. being booked like somebody who has a toll taken on him. Right. So, uh, I agree with Brett with that one. But now the whole thing was good, and the, and the shit at the end was great because it really added some heat. Like, they've been buddy-buddy, you know, I respect you, I'm going to beat you, blah, blah, blah. This time you see them pissed off at each other, and you, you you can tell they're ready to just beat the shit out of each other. And um, this is a really, really solid angle to get to that point. Yeah, I thought Marty was a good little piece of the puzzle. Yeah, there. Not, nice. not that he meant anything, but to Sean he did. So when Sean came yeah. out like, what's your deal? And then Brett's like, hey, worry about me, not about him, you fucking lousy hyena. That's, you know, that was kind of cool. I thought that was a nice little addition there. As Sean kind of leaves with Jose Lothario, and Brett gets back on commentary just for the moment at ringside. He says he wants to make it clear. He considers Sean a friend, not an enemy. He respects Sean. He has no choice, though, but to pound Michaels into the dirt for 60 minutes at WrestleMania. So making it very clear, even though he respects Shawn Michaels as an athlete, as a competitor, Bret Hart's going to do what he does with The Undertaker, what he does with Diesel. He's going to do whatever it takes to retain the belt. And I wrote at this point, this was a third of Raw. We're a third of the way through. I know Raw was only an hour, but we're a third of a way through the show, and they spent at least a third of the show building towards that main event at WrestleMania. So I thought they did a, a very good job Excellent with their job. time here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We get another Ultimate Warrior video as he returns, and we see him back at WrestleMania 8 when he returned last time. Four years ago, and he's on his way back one more time. Can't wait to see how that works out. And for the first time that, that I've noticed, they've actually mentioned the Slammies. The Slammies are coming back this Saturday. Can't wait to see that one. I, I enjoyed the Slammies. It was something different, very unique for the time. I like Tom, Todd Pengel's little was, uh, opening songs there. Yeah, and this one was really good because they basically spent the whole hour, or however long it was, just letting Sean and Brett go back and forth with each other. That's really what it felt like this first year anyway. <laughs> I, I liked it. Back to the ring. It's Triple H. But we just saw the Warrior video, so now we're seeing his opponent at WrestleMania, Triple H in the ring, taking out Aldo Montoya, the Portuguese man of war. Triple H dominates this one as he needs to. Aldo does get a quick comeback, goes to the top rope with a nice body block for near fall, but it's pedigree time, ends it. Triple H gets the win, 4 minutes, 32 seconds. 
That was an important key match, I thought, on this show. You need to get Triple H in there. Give him a win over anybody <laughs> going to that match with the Warrior. Yeah, absolutely. He destroyed him outside of that crossbody, and that's what you needed from him. Yeah. Goldust on set in his Hollywood back lot. It, it mentions that it is edited for TV. We'll see what that means here in a minute. He has a Roddy Piper mannequin as he begins groping it and rubbing it, both the mannequin and himself, by the way. Starts to go down on the mannequin and edited for TV, Steve. Did you notice he starts slowly kneeling down towards the crotch of the mannequin and the show just cuts. And all of a sudden he's standing face to face with the mannequin again. That's what they meant when they said edited for TV. Goldie (laughs) then gets pissed off at the dummy and beats the living shit out of it. Throws it into a pipe or something around the line. Breaks the mannequin in half. And I, I guess this is pleasure before pain, maybe? I'm not really sure what's going on here, but Goldust is ready for WrestleMania, I suppose, and his backlot brawl with the hot rod. Yeah, another one of those weird promos by Goldust here. Definitely pushing the envelope as far as he can. Yeah, I just uh, I didn't understand what it said when it said edited for TV, and then when they start selling it like he's about to go down on the dummy, and it cuts, and he's back standing up as if he's finished. Whatever he went down to do, I was like, wow, okay, I get it. You too, Steve, can order a WWF embroidered jacket. Get your name on the on there as well as the logo. 100% wool blend and the, the sleeves are 100% leather. Only $60. No, wait. Only three easy payments of $60. It's $180. I think in today's day and age, that's uh, about double that. So, wow, that's a lot of money. For these WWF jackets, but you can have your name. You can say Steve on it, because you know it's not a lot of people named Steve out there. No thanks. You can. You <laughs> might be able to find one. That's a common name, Steve. You never know. Uh, I don't want one. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, man. <laughs> I, I out of all the shop zones, this one was dud. Uh, mm. I'll defend the shop zones and. I know what this shit's going for now, and I wish I had some, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm more of a fan of this than the denim jacket. I'll, I'll, I'll put this over the oh, denim jacket. Oh, the denim jacket's <laughs> trash. I will say, though, I was looking up on eBay for some WrestleMania 12 chairs, and there's none on there. Uh, but there was like a WrestleMania 11 one for like a for $1,000. So uh, those replica chairs. You can put it up there for anything. Somebody actually has to buy it then. Hey, I was uh, looking at sold listings. There, There's okay. some on there getting that. I'm not paying shit for anything that has the words WrestleMania 11 on it anywhere. I don't (laughs) care what it is. Um, There was one on there that I think a WrestleMania 13 chair that actually went really high. So um, they they fetch a pretty penny, man. The wait is over, Steve. Next week, Mankind will make his WWF debut. He's coming home. Have a nice day. Vince McMahon in the ring for a promo with The Undertaker and Paul Bearer. At one time, The Undertaker may have been content with just beating Diesel, but after laying his hands on Paul Bear last week, the corpse in the casket from last week is Diesel's future, says The Undertaker. Basically, I think he's going to murder Diesel at WrestleMania. He tells Diesel he will rest in peace. It pretty much solidifies it. I think Taker's looking to kill Diesel at WrestleMania. This is actually a really good promo, and I think it... I don't know if it was record. Well, yeah, this is three eleven. He gave notice three five. So hey, he he made a line in there. They said the one shining star is now a dismal light uh, because when he looks in the eyes of the Reaper, his fate lies in his hands. So yeah, uh, it felt like it was kind of a little bit of a shoot with that line. The one shining star. How he's a dismal light now. Uh, it kind of felt authentic. It, obviously, it was in the tone of an Undertaker promo, but I, I really like that line. Yeah. This is actually a good promo by Undertaker. Yeah, one of his more lengthy promos. He actually got to actually cut a promo here and kind of. And he talked talked. fast a little bit. Yeah, that was uh, definitely his his character's changing, and it'll change a whole lot more moving forward once Mankind gets here. I can't Uh, wait. I can't wait. Quick clip of Doc Hendricks and his band here at ringside playing Bad Street Atlanta. G- I was really surprised when I saw this way back in the day. I'm like, holy shit, they're playing the Freebirds theme on WWF TV. Blew my mind at the time. Shawn Michaels' final presentation is we see a preparation and training video with a Jim Ross voiceover. We then see an additional video of Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Shawn 
What happens to the man if he realizes his dream? What happens to the boy if he doesn't? On the other end, they talk Bret Hart. One day, memories will become greater than a dream. Will he still be able to call himself champion? Or will he become immortal like the rest of us? They're basically trying to talk about the future of both guys. This is like make it or break it for both guys the way they're selling this. Sean could realize the boyhood dream and become a man. And if he doesn't, what happens to the rest of his career? He could be done. This is it. On the other end, Bret Hart is the champion. He's been the man. He is immortal, so to speak. If he has the belt taken from him, where where does he go from here? I thought this was a fun little video. Yeah, it was great. And it's, um, it's different. They didn't. They didn't really ever put the champion in a position or the challenger, for the most part, in a position to where they felt vulnerable. A lot of the times, the, the champion, obviously, like, I'm, I'm going back to the Hogan time where Hogan, you, you never thought he was ever in jeopardy. So you didn't really see one or both, like, but one guy would look weak, but the other guy would look very strong. This is the first time where both, guy have, both guys have everything on the line. Uh, so to speak, for me anyway, as, yeah. as far as a uh, a first time, even like when Luger fought Yoko at SummerSlam, when they said if he doesn't win, this is his only shot. Like I didn't even really buy that. Like he wasn't in much danger of. Uh, I'll say that. Ever. I don't want to spend too much time on you know uh, Yoko and and Luger, but I'll say this. Um, I don't know that I didn't think they would wrestle again, but the, the, yeah. the, that finish, I was like, Luger's done. I'll tell you that yeah, much. <laughs> exactly. And I feel like if that happened here, like Sean lost, I don't know if he'd ever be champion. Uh, right. It may happen a while, like down the line, but you only really have one shot to catch lightning in a bottle. And, that, yeah. and that's what this was. And uh, they obviously took advantage. If it wasn't going to happen here, there's no way you can go back to back manias and lose the title match and ever be taken serious in 96 anyway. It could happen in 98, 99, whatever, but um after rebuilding it but this is really it this is really your only opportunity so i like the way they built to this they put both guy in tremendous pressure to go out there and win the match so uh, definitely different and unique yeah we saw a, a final training video of Shawn michaels were then traded to a final preparation and training video of bret hart in calgary alberta canada jim ross does the voiceover for this as well bret hart compares sean and bret hart to what he went through with the Macho Man several years earlier. He says one day he was knocking on the Macho Man's door, then he passed him by. And now it's Shawn Michaels knocking on Brett's door, but Brett's not ready to let him pass him by just quite yet. I thought it was interesting how they played the Macho Man into this, used the Macho Man's name here. Um, Interesting. And again, it just felt like Brett was telling the truth in his own world. Yeah. You know Brett's probably standing in the back back in the day. Okay, that's the guy I got to pass. Like, Hogan's untouchable. I'm not going to get to him, but I compare myself to Macho. So if I can get past Macho, I'm going to get to that next level. And I, I can see that. That makes sense. And I'm wondering if this was just Brett going off the cuff and that's what it seemed you like really think me. he got approval from Vince to say this? Cause, I, mean, I don't think they were really getting approval to say anything back then. So I, I just think yeah, it was Brett so telling, think, telling like it was. It was cool. I was kind of surprised, but in a way I'm not because it's, it's putting kind of macho in a bad light. I passed him by like I'm better than macho man. So it wasn't like Savage looked good in a good light anyway. So right. Vince probably didn't give a shit. But um, yeah, very, very good stuff there. I liked it. I liked that whole video vignette package they did there. It was really good. Yeah. So not only did they spend about a third of the show earlier with Brett and Sean, they actually incorporate more of it here. So probably at least half the show is Brett and Sean here as it should be. That's your world title match. Your, just, that's a more than a third of Mania. your pay-per-view. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a third <laughs> of your pay-per-view. Mind you, it's an hour long match. It's an hour and two minutes actually, but it's an hour long match. Theoretically speaking, and it's your world title match. It's really your bread and butter on the show. As we go into the main event of Monday Night Raw, it's Ahmed Johnson taking on Owen Hart to come to the ring by Jim Cornette. Diana Hart we see, and the crowd will see her a lot more often here in the upcoming weeks. The British Bulldog also comes to ringside to root on Owen Hart. As we're told Jake and Yoko are not here, which is kind of odd because they've been here the rest of the TV taping, but whatever you say, Vince. Ahmed Johnson. I over- for you, though. Yeah. Real quick, while he's talking about Diana, I didn't uh-huh. want to wait to the end. Um, sure. 
Did you hear the line that Lawler said? I can only imagine. Here early on, he mm-hmm. was like, Vince, you realize slowly but surely most of the family starting to agree with Owen now because <laughs> Bulldog's heel, Owen's yeah. heel. Diana's taking Bulldog and Owen's side. I thought Lawler did an excellent job. I know he wasn't foreshadowing to anything in the future that we would possibly be seeing, but I, I thought it was a great wit- heel tactic that he used there where, look, Brett was the one that was full of shit, not Owen and Bulldog, so right. um, or Diana. So I thought it was a really great line. Uh, it was great. I thought. No, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, I didn't really, I didn't really notice too hard. I guess uh, Lawler's commentary here. Lawler's usually just Lawler at this point, anyway. But that's pretty cool that he uh, kind of acknowledges sometimes every, he does every... get those. Yeah, he sometimes does. Get sometimes lines in that, yeah, that do really, really well. Kind of like Heenan, but Heenan's obviously way better. Um, he knows what's going on. Where Lawler's just doing. It. Joke books, but um, right. good line there. As the match goes on, Ahmed overpowers Owen and uh, sloppy, dangerous looking ass spine buster very early into the match mm-hmm. kind of pivots with it and, and damn near uh, just cripples Owen. As uh, yeah, it was just not pretty. It's Ahmed being Ahmed. The Bulldog winds up distracting Johnson and Owen nails a sp- spin kick to the back of Ahmed, sends him out to the floor. Brief heat by Owen Hart before running into an Ahmed spine buster. Yes, the one where he just drives people down on the back of their head. Didn't you say somebody said it was more dangerous than the actual Pearl River plunge itself? It certainly looks so. Yeah, I wouldn't want to take it from Ahmed. No, no. way. Arn Anderson, he is not when it comes to protecting people with that spine buster. No, he drove Although Owen he down. If I was Owen, I would have been like, hey, how about give me the Pearl River plunge and then go for the spine buster and we'll break that up. But instead, it's Ahmed with the spine buster connects. Then he goes for the Pearl River Plunge, but the British Bulldog attacks to prevent that from happening, causing a disqualification. Only five minutes is the match. Ahmed actually fights Owen and the Bulldog off, but Vader attacks, and it's a triple team on Ahmed Johnson until Yokozuna and Jake the Snake Roberts down to ringside, and even Yokozuna, as you mentioned at the top of the show, is faster than Jake. Yoko gets here way before Jake the Snake Roberts even, and Yoko, you know, he's not a bill of, uh, you know, perfect health either, but he's he's a, a good 20 yards in front of Jake as Yoko and Jake eventually clear the ring. So even though they announced Jake and Yoko weren't here, they really were here. The joke's on you, Camp you Cornet. Stick around. It's kind of <laughs> stupid. I don't know. Well, you know what, though? Last week they was in that video where they weren't necessarily there live, or that was on Superstars, right? Uh no no that was after the match though they were uh they were there but you got to remember this is four weeks of tapings they're here they've already been on yeah. TV Jake's wrestled a match here well, on yeah, TV yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so just, I mean these the fans here know, know that they're, they're here. here yeah Jake What's, was in the match yeah never mind never mind I'm confused because yeah. what stole me off is they did that video where no vid- nobody was in the crowd and it was, but that was from Superstars I thought that was on Raw I know they aired it on Raw but it was from Superstars so right my bad sorry. No, you're fine. It's just I didn't understand them even announcing that they weren't there if they were just going to have them run either. out and do I'm this. Trying to, I'm trying to figure out what the point is. Why would you say they're not there? And then if you see Ahmed getting the shit beat out of him, you're just going to turn the channel. Okay, they're not there. Nothing's going to happen. The heels are just going to dominate. I'm going to go see what's in it on Nitro. I suppose and, you're thinking, um, oh, well, this is the way the faces lured the heels in so that they could come out and do the. I don't, I don't know. I'm making excuses for this shit, I suppose. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand it. Big props to Vince McMahon and, of course, Jerry Lawler assists him in selling the entire WrestleMania card to close the show. They take turns announcing all the matches on the pay-per-view. And we close the show with the old Bret Hart, you start the fire music video. But there's no more billionaire Ted sketches, as we pointed out last week. It was to be continued, the FTC with Ted Turner. It's no more. You'll have to wait till WrestleMania, at least the free-for-all of WrestleMania, to see the Huckster take on the Nacho Man to close out the sketches once and for all. That concludes the final episode of Raw going into WrestleMania. And I have to say a tremendous effort and focus on the WrestleMania card for the last several weeks in a row. Every single segment has had something to do with WrestleMania. Not a wasted segment. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. It's, uh, it's not the greatest build to a mania it's not the greatest matches on a mania but when you compare it to what you get today where 
week over week, everything's different, and you have no idea what the hell's going on. This is four weeks taped in a what a, a two day period or a one day period. One, it's one show of TV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, one one shot, and they absolutely killed it. It's just such a fre- a breath of fresh air. Like you can shit on ninety six all you want, but just the fact that you get solid booking months in advance, weeks, week over week over week progression, sign me up all day. I don't care who's in the ring. Just give me stories that matter. Everybody said, well, they don't have good wrestling on TV now. Well, the wrestling's fine. It's it's always been okay. It's just the stories behind the wrestling make absolutely no sense, and that's what they're missing out on. You can have five-star matches all day, but if the, the story to get to that five-star match is shit, nobody cares. And so that's what they're missing now, and when you can watch it, live it. You know, we just watched three months' worth of TV and pay-per-views, and – um they absolutely killed the mania build. Uh, everything mattered. Every segment mattered, like you stated. Every match that should matter matters. Excellent, excellent job. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of a segment where something had, you know, it, it, every single segment had something to do with the pay per view. I mean, even if you, even if it was a quick goblin squash, they're headed to the finals of the tag team tournament. So, I mean, everything yeah. has had something to do with with WrestleMania. Just an entire taping of just segments about nothing but WrestleMania. Really, really excellent job. Again, not not a lot of the matches were, you know, uh, five-star classics, but at the end of the day, everything yeah. did what it needed to do to get us to the pay-per-view. And that's really all the TV was about back then. That's what TV's for. I mean, I don't want to see five-star matches on TV. You got to pay for those. That's what you pay for. You pay for the good matches. I mean... We talk about it all the time. There's no footage of like those Iron Man matches between the Rujos and the Rockers. Yeah. Like I would pay to go back in time to see one of those matches for an hour. I would do it. Like sure. that's a, that's a tremendous match that you'd want to pay for. And if they just give it away on TV every other week, then what the hell's the, the value in it? There is none. So that's what people don't understand about today. They want five star matches on Monday every night or Wednesday or whenever the hell T wrestling's on. Right. And you just don't that's not what wrestling is. You need to sell your pay per views. I and agree. I guess when you give them away for ten bucks a month, how much value is <laughs> in them anyway? Yeah, well, I think that's how Vince looks at it too. Like, I don't have to give him shit. It's ten dollars. Fuck it. Throw some shit exactly. out there. Pretty much until the cash. So, and somehow people keep on paying for their shit. Who they knows? Do. They do. Segment of the night <laughs> was it Shawn Michaels and Leaf Cassidy the. Entire Brett and Sean build-up videos. Goldust in the back lot. Or the six-man brawl to end the show. If you if we can pick the Brett-Sean build-up, I'd go with that. But I'm going to go with the match. I'm going to go with Sean and Leaf Cassidy. Uh, it was There were some scary spots. And it's amazing that Al Snow gets, keeps on getting these opportunities. And every single time he's out there in a new gimmick, he's still messing up. Yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> He needs to slow down and take a deep breath and just realize, okay, you're into big time. Yeah, you can get let go at any time, but if you don't do anything stupid, you're not going to get let go. So just take a deep breath, slow down, do what you know you can do, and um, get out of there. I I don't think Sean looked too happy after some of the spots, and you could tell, but he didn't blow a gasket like you mentioned, like you did on the reporter at WrestleMania 11 or some of the other stuff we see. uh, Like Vader at SummerSlam 96? (laughs) Vader at SummerSlam coming up. I thought it was a pretty solid match and pretty good. I liked the stuff with Brett and Sean after the match. Got some heat on that match. But like you like we talked about, this was just an excellent show top to bottom as far as WrestleMania build goes. Yeah, I almost wanted to pick just the Brett and Sean video package that they did where they kind of sandwiched the video of the two contrasting what would happen to them after their match, uh, sandwiched that with the training videos. But I also thought about this stuff after the actual Brett and Sean match, or the Sean and Leaf Cassidy match with Brett at ringside, it was very hard to determine. I know it was Brett and Sean related something I wanted to pick, so I, I went with the match as well, only because Sean got a match, he got to showcase himself in the ring, while Brett was on commentary, and they had a little bit of a, a gripe after the match as well, so that kind of played into it, but I thought Brett did a pretty decent job on commentary. I thought Sean coming out a winner, going into the pay-per-view, was a pretty big deal as well. You noticed- he won with his finisher too, unlike Brett. That's right. Brett. Unlike Brett, right. <laughs> yep. Super so, kick, baby. So, so yeah, I, I think I have to go Sean and, and Leaf Cassidy here. And if I had to really 
dissect the show again. It would still be something Sean and Brett related. Just they did a really good job. If only the match delivered like like some of this. But I'll have more on that here coming up in uh, the upcoming uh, Monday Warfare show of what that match was supposed to be versus what it winds up being. But that is what it is. We'll talk about that on the next episode. Meanwhile. The ratings are in once again as WCW Monday Nitro draws a 3.1, which is actually their lowest in six weeks, but yet still enough to topple Raw, which does a 2.8, their lowest in two months, and going into WrestleMania. Bad week all around for both. Nitro with a 3.1, Raw with a 2.8, and both of them, they haven't done this bad since going back to early to mid-January. I don't know what the hell's going on here. March Madness. Must be. Um, what's interesting is, is Nitro has its lowest rating in six weeks without Hogan. So that, oh boy. that whole... Oh, boy. That whole... Uh, I can hear no, Hogan now. In general, no, no, I'm just saying in general, like that whole... If, you, if you're reading The Observer at this point, you know, they're talking about how Hogan's using his power and all this stuff, and are they better off without him? Uh, who knows? But also on the other side, it's weird that Raw is, you know, in the two still, but their mm-hmm. house at MSG is getting 17,000 people. Right. So the house show business is picking up, but the ratings are still staying a little flat. They're not really moving up and down. Um, so definitely interesting to see that, you know, it's, a little disappointing, just, uh, given that this was the, the lead into WrestleMania, though. I, I didn't expect anything crazy. I wasn't looking for a record breaking number here. Just the old typical 3.1 or something like that. I was hoping I was, I was expecting here for this particular raw going into WrestleMania. I know I go agree. home shows back then were a little different than they are, you know, moving, you know, in later years and things like that, though. But yeah, yeah I was a little, little, little bit surprised there. But again, when you look at the card at the end of the day. Shawn Michaels versus Leaf Cassidy, things like that. That's not really, you know, well, super. I, if I if I'm going to get WrestleMania, Steve, I'm going to get it with or without this show. I guess yeah, is, I agree. Uh, I think the Mania build's already done by this yeah, show, right? Um, so they know what everybody kind of knows how WWF style. You know, Brett and Shawn aren't going to get physical a week out. They would have done it by now. Um, Even if they did, it would have been a pull apart. There would have been nothing pull apart. Crazy. Would, nothing would have happened. Right. It would have been like Pillman flailing all over the place the week prior, you know, uh, something like that. Or Jose would have just broke it up before anything happened, like kind of what happened here. So, uh, And then you had the big angle uh, last week with Diesel. Uh, really, the big angle here was the, the Gold Dust video. And um, I don't know how big that's drawing or it, what the care meter is on that one. Right, right. So I, I, that's really the only thing they had left to push, to be honest, because uh, they did everything else last week. Outside of the main event, and that main event's already sold. So, uh, probably people would probably be like, "I'm just going to watch tonight. I already know what's going to happen on Raw. Who cares?" So, um, who's the real winner here for you? Is it the uh, Go Home Show? Is it the Raw Go Home to WrestleMania, or is it uh, WCW Nitro? Probably going to be surprising here, but I'm going to go with Raw. Uh, I just felt like with it being the Go Home Show to Mania, they got all the major players. Uh, they really drove the card home. I thought they did an excellent job of buttoning things up, and I was more than ready for Mania after this show. I, I always get excited. Everybody gets excited for Mania. Uh, and this show did a lot for me for that main event. I was excited to see those two. I was always a Brat guy. And an hour with Shawn Michaels, you just have these thoughts and ideas of what they can do because they are two of the best in the ring. And so you, you think that, like, you get excited for it. And obviously, I was bored out of my mind, but uh, <laughs> going into it, I was excited. It's funny. I think I heard somebody say, I don't know who said it. I, I can't give credit, but whenever WWF tries to sell you on a match that it's going to be the greatest match of all time, it usually never is. So um, this was the start of that, I felt like. I, I will say Nitro had the better action. They had the better matches. Um, it was probably a little bit more entertaining as far as overall action goes. It's just their booking philosophy just drives me nuts and uh it really impacts their quality of shows we have a champion on raw who is established it means everything to both of these guys and you're going to pay big money to see wrestlemania i would never i can't say never but because i did it but i would never pay money to see a wcw pay-per-view for a title match outside of sting and hogan that's really the only one i ever paid for and after I did that, I never would do it again. 
Yeah, I was uh, or I got my WCW pay per views for a night of action. Really, I just was really excited to watch the whole yeah. pay per view overall. But um, in this regards, it's very hard for me to determine which which one I like better because I thought Raw did a great job to do what it needed to do, but the action was definitely much better on Nitro. In fact, I, I watched Nitro before I watched Raw, and when you're watching one, I don't I don't know about you, but I'm not thinking about geez that other shows the go home show to WrestleMania. Like I'm not thinking about that when I'm watching Nitro. Like, geez, I wonder what's on Raw or this that, and the other. I'm just watching Nitro. And as I watch this Nitro, I'm just thinking match after match after match. Man, I don't know how Raw's going to top this. This is, it's nothing's, like I said, nothing's five star, but it's still like, wow, Savage and Finley and, you know, all these, ma- like every match for the most part was like, this is good quality TV wrestling. This is great. So I thought from top to bottom, like, man, I'd like to see how Raw's going to top this. Then I flip over to my Raw, and I turn the Raw show on, and I realize, oh, shit, this is the go-home show to WrestleMania. And the quality of wrestling on this show is nowhere near Nitro. So if I just want to talk quality of enjoyable watching the TV show, I'm going Nitro. That's what I'm going to do, even though I get it. It's the go-home show to Raw, and they did a good job going home to WrestleMania, and I'm not going to shit on them for that. So I'm just trying to – I'm trying to just – Look at it as a TV show and not worry about, even though it's hard to do, not worry about that WrestleMania is six days away. And I'm, I just, I thought I was just really, really, I was just really pleased with Nitro when it ended. I'm like, wow, I was really refreshing compared to all the shit that we've been handed for so many months now because of Hulk Hogan. I agree with you completely. The action was better uh, for sure. Nitro still has that fresh new car smell. Uh, as far as the look and the production, so like that always is a plus. And I, it's hard; it's it's almost impossible to go back to a ten year old mind, or in your case, a fifteen year old mind. How old you were for me? Because I, I like what I like. I love Nitro. It was cutting edge and it was great, and I loved it when I was a kid. It was nonstop action. I didn't really give a shit what the stories were or what they were trying to do. Oh, man, I get to see the Giant and Ric Flair in the ring together. Or I get to see Hogan and Ric Flair for 900 times. I didn't care. I, I loved it. But now it's just I, I can't turn off my mind the way it works now to where I want a good story. I want a solid story that has a beginning, middle, and end. And WWF is far and away better at that at this point. Not right. now, obviously. But yeah. back in 96, that's what I like now. But I don't mind either show, to be honest with you. This is a toss-up show to me. Uh, it's really tough to pick one. I just I tried to take WrestleMania out of the equation, and I asked myself, if WrestleMania wasn't in the equation, which one was the better show? And I just had to go with Nitro. I thought just a lot better wrestling, I guess. <laughs> I just like booking. I, I, I guess I just like booking. Uh, that's, that's, that must be what it is. I thought both shows did what they needed to do this week. Uh, one of them was entertaining, and the other one needed to sell a pay per view, like the pay per view. And I thought Vince, like I said, I'm, I give them uh, kudos and, and props for staying on track all this time. I mean, really, not just going to WrestleMania, but crazy. all of it. You know, yeah. It's, uh, uh, Nitro we'll we'll kind of button it up here, but I just gotta say, how hard is it to stay course when you're losing week after week after week by? Just slimmest of margins. Like obviously last week was I think was an anomaly. You know, it was seven points or whatever it was. Yeah. It's always like three point one to two point nine or three point oh to three point one or something like that to where it's so close and like you just in your mind you just wanna scrap everything and throw something at the wall just to get a win. Um but early on Vince realized it's a it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and so he did what he wanted to do. He took his time to adjust, um, but when he did, <laughs> it was a wrap. I don't know that he realized that. You know, he's very concerned. He's putting things out like he's worried about it. You know, these guys yeah, they're, they're yeah. getting run out of business by the summer. I just don't think they'd ever been punched in the face like this before, and they didn't know how to respond. And really, they they didn't know how to change shit. They are you see them changing shit like the the entire. Well, look at gold dust. Oh, yeah. Just just to begin with, that kind of diesel <laughs> and just some of the other. Yes, yeah, Sunny. Uh, a lot of different people changing up their characters. Even the Undertaker's kind of coming alive a little bit now, so to speak. So everybody's changing up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, no, yeah. it was uh, 
Very fun. We're going into WrestleMania, which means we're closing out March of 1996. We're heading into the month of April now. We'll be back uh, with more, and that will be in the month of April. I think next time on Monday Warfare, it'll be two weeks of Raw and one week of Nitro. No Nitro for April 8th, I believe. So that's where we'll be at next time we're here. Yeah, we also get the old classic uh, playoffs coming up in May. They're stuck in Disney. All sorts of things going on here in this second year of uh, Nitro that really had an impact. <laughs> yeah, they'll be uh, moving to two hours here, too, in a couple of months. So. Hey. And hey, Less those, uh, those Hall and Nash <laughs> guys are on their way in as well. We'll talk a lot about that, I'm Ooh. sure, in the next several episodes of the show as well. So, Steve, thanks for being here, man. Appreciate it. We, uh, we're here. we here. We made it through the road to WrestleMania 12. That's up next. That'll be up, I'm sure. Around the corner, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, pretty soon, you guys can go check it out on patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. The watch along for WrestleMania 12 is me and Steve try to figure out how to make it through an entire hour of Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels. It's been probably 30 years since I've seen it. 25 years. Well, if it's been 30 it's years, be, Steve, that's, that's tremendous. Because it's in the future. <laughs> yes. We're in the future. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, it's been probably 20 years at least. I don't watch it. I, I cut WrestleMania off at the main event. So Yeah, I've literally seen that match when it aired live and about half of it in the last couple of years. And that's pretty much all I've seen. That's it for me as well. <laughs> so yeah. it'll be interesting. It'll be like everything's brand new. I remember Shawn Michaels super kicking a timekeeper or something. Outside uh, of that, I remember a whole hell of a lot. It, it'll be fun. We got through an hour of Doomsday and the street fight, so we can get through an hour of Brett and Sean. Yeah, just got to figure out things to talk about. You guys want to send us topics, questions? We can answer your questions <laughs> during that uh, Iron Man match. <laughs> uh, but, Steve, yeah, appreciate you being here for this one, man. We'll, uh, we'll be back uh, on the other side of this. We'll be talking about the fallout from WrestleMania 12, everything that happens, and we'll be heading into April of 1996, the Warriors return. We may have a new World Mankind. Wrestling Federation champion. Lots of things going on. Mankind. Yeah, Mankind. Johnny B. Bad. Oh, well, you know, he's not, not, not allowed to be called Johnny B. Bad anymore. He's, he's well, Mark Merrow. We haven't seen him yet, so he's, gonna be, just, he's still Johnny B. Bad, right? Well, no, he's Mark Merrow because that's his real name, right? So that's all. I'm just mm-hmm. uh, Or Merrow Wits, maybe, I think. I think I read. I think his real name is Mark Merrow. Marvelous Mero Wits. Mark Merrow. That's weird. Marvelous. It's like a cross between Barry Horowitz and Mark Merrow. <laughs> and we're Mar- done here. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not marvelous yet. He's just wild. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wild man. My bad. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> All right, guys. We better get going. I appreciate you, though, yes. Steve, uh, getting this done. We'll be back and again very soon with another edition of Monday Warfare, The Battles Within. <laughs> <laughs> 